Good afternoon, everyone. I'm your MC Lakshmi. I'm a Bachelor of Social Science and Psychology student. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the QESS Teacher Workshop funded by the Education Bureau. We're very honored to have Professor Eric Q with us today to share with us the opportunities, challenges, and good practices of blended learning in the post-COVID-19 era. So without further ado, would you please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Professor Eric Chu on the stage. Professor Chu, please, thank you. My usual style is just to ask uh, whether the audio is coming through loud and clear. Okay, so, and what about the uh, ones uh, who are online? Okay, wonderful. It's, a, it's an overwhelming uh, ratio. Uh, my uh, experience in uh, delivering the hybrid uh, teaching or hybrid learning, so I've never experienced such a, uh, a contrast where I would say that something like uh, maybe 85 to 90% of the people are online, whereas only about uh, a handful, I should say, apart from the technical staff, only a handful to, uh, of, uh, of colleagues are only attending to, uh, in person. So uh, be that as it may. So hopefully, uh, you know, to, through the talk, we can uh, compare and contrast the uh, experience. It's very important about uh, the experience that, uh, that you, uh, uh, will encounter because uh, that uh, makes a lot of difference in terms of uh, the knowledge transfer and absorption. All right, uh, I've set this title for the talk, the Blended Learning in Post-COVID-19 Era. Now, to, uh, I have to emphasize that, uh, in fact, what we're going to share and discuss today, um, it's applicable to all times. It's not because of COVID-19. If you think that what I'm going to present today is because of COVID-19 or because of uh, after we have come out of COVID-19. Uh, that's not exact, exactly correct. In fact, a lot of the things that uh, I'm talking about and I will be talking about are applicable and should be done, you know, to, uh, even before um, COVID-19 uh, set in. Uh, why COVID-19 is there in the title is because I believe as a result of COVID-19, of course, the, nobody wants it, uh, we were forced to try this and try that, and we have gained uh, valuable experience during the last, I suppose, 18 months, which uh, now we should capitalize on and do more, you know, to, in order to transform education in a way that uh, we can deliver uh, superior learning experience and much better educational services for our students. Okay, let me see if I can advance the slide. always some minor technical hiccup, but I don't think there will be any problem. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to uh, scan this uh, QR code because, uh, you know, we'll be doing uh, a fair amount of uh, interactions. I'll be talking for, uh, you know, a fair part of the session, but uh, your input is equally valuable. And I would, uh, from time to time, draw on your input to discuss more and to uh, reflect on uh, what we have exchanged, okay? So please, um, all of you uh, online, as well as those who are attending in person, bring out your uh, smartphone, start an app that actually scan a QR code and scan this one, all right? Um, I'll put it up for another 10 seconds. Okay, now if you have uh, scanned the code, you should be able to see, um, see this page, all right? Uh, you don't need to uh, fill in anything right now, to, just to be uh, sure that uh, you've scanned it correctly, you should see something like that, you know, a better problem, a better format than this one, okay? So uh, let me go back to the PowerPoint. And then uh, when the time comes, we uh, will go and revisit that uh, multimedia page, okay? All right, it's always difficult for me to um, come up with the starting point of a seminar. And uh, with this seminar, it's a title is so wide, challenges, uh, opportunities, 
and good practices, you know, uh, we can go from anywhere to anywhere. Uh, I thought that uh, perhaps uh, we used uh, um, learning in the 21st century as a starting point, as an entry point, so that, uh, you know, uh, we are on the same page and we can align and proceed from there, because with that, uh, we can uh, highlight some of the challenges, uh, indeed, uh, significant challenges that uh, we are all facing, uh, we, university, uh, uh, students, learners, and so forth, and then see how we can uh, jointly tackle some of these uh, challenges. Now, of course, everybody knows whenever there's change, not only there are challenges, but there are also opportunities. So uh, be interesting to see how we can actually capitalize on some of these opportunities as well. Uh, and then uh, I will, uh, especially in the second part of the talk, uh, we will discuss more and share, you know, the collective polyu experience, not just mine, the collective polyu experience about uh, some of the common challenges that we all encounter, you know, in whatever forms of, uh, of uh, 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 online learning that you are doing. For example, how do you build trust and bonding with your students? How do you ensure that students are inspired and motivated to continue to learn? How do you know that your student is paying attention while you're talking? And how do you actually, uh, you know, to, uh, assess them to, uh, properly based on uh, what you are trying to, uh, to measure and so forth? So allow me to put up this uh, dividing line. I mean, it's not a, um, a very uh, rigid uh, yardstick, but uh, the, the divider uh, helps us to, um, you know, to divide the content of this afternoon's seminar into two parts. And the way that I categorize it, uh, the first part um, probably taking uh, the most of uh, uh, what I'm talking now and to the break uh, in the next hour, it's about uh, strategizing. It's about uh, what are some of the things that we should be doing, you know, in the light of attending to uh, addressing the problems of learning in the 21st century with uh, globalization, with digitalization, with the uh, huge uh, influx of data and more. And uh, on the other hand, uh, and the uh, post uh, break session, we'll focus more on the operational issues, right? That uh, just about all teachers uh, probably have encountered and all teachers probably would have uh, uh, solutions or partial solutions to those. So uh, I'll be interested to uh, hear about uh, some of your sharing as well. So hopefully, you know, uh, with this, uh, do blend it together. To, uh, there's a um, there's a win-win situation for everybody, right? Because uh, I don't know, you know, with your background, some of you could be, uh, educational administrators, some of you could be uh, uh, professors, uh, curriculum design, some of you are lecturers who are actually, uh, you know, delivering a course, some of you could be learners, students, and so forth. Well, to, uh, with uh, digitalization, I mean, it's quite obvious, uh, without uh, any further to substantiation, to, uh, we are living in an increasingly connected society. Things are, uh, you know, they're very, uh, uh, becoming more and more easier to be uh, revealed, to be found. You know, there's a uh, influx of data, information, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of information, uh, connections out there, you know, beyond uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the structure of a university or any particular entity. So uh, we should be looking at, uh, today, we should be looking at, uh, you know, to helping our students to focus on learning, not only just within the classroom, not only from the lecturer, not only from the professor, but also among themselves. And also to, uh, turning to the outside world to see how they can actually harness learning, uh, learning capabilities, learning networks from the outside. Writing is on the wall. Um, we, are, we are not moving fast enough, we being uh, academic institutions, we're not moving fast enough to, uh, you know, to, to keep up with the pace of, uh, of development outside. And this uh, report uh, from the UK University, it's alarming, you know, if not disturbing. It says that uh, even back in 2018, uh, it has been identified that uh, you know, to almost half of the undergraduate curriculum for science and engineering subjects, you know, they'd be obsolete uh, uh, before students graduate. So uh, uh, we have to ask ourselves, you know, should we continue to teach in this way? Should we, uh, you know, conduct a significant curriculum development? Well, the answer is uh, no and yes, but uh, there's more than curriculum development or revamp that we need to do. So university realized this problem. We have, uh, like in Poly U, we have uh, service learning, we have uh, the uh, uh, GUR uh, subjects and more and the car clusters and so forth, but they're still not moving fast enough to, uh, you know, to help our students to, uh, to be future proof, to, to enable them to uh, deal with the increasingly uncertain uh, future world that uh, they are graduating into. Again, uh, reflecting back into the 21st century, uh, 
I think uh, you are definitely, uh, you know, agree uh, uh, and more than just realizing that uh, we are surrounded by a lot of data. We're surrounded by, uh, you know, powerful tools to unveil new information, connections, connecting with people, right? And also, to, uh, uh, we are also uh, uh, um, having uh, capabilities, or we should be developing capabilities to tap into the trustworthy networks that can so extend our capabilities and also the expertise uh, harnessing. So how are we gonna do this? Uh, now there's no uh, universal solution to this, but I hope uh, through the rest of this seminar, so I'll be able to, uh, uh, through uh, some of my work, some of my colleagues work, and some of the, uh, you know, the best practices that are harnessed from overseas as well, to get a shed light on how to, you know, take advantage of some of these things and be able to provide a more, uh, you know, to refreshing uh, uh, learning environment for our students. As I said, you know, to our writings on the wall, no one has a solution, you know, to, uh, I wouldn't believe it if someone has the perfect solution. Uh, we have to uh, go into an experimental mode, right? We have to conduct more and more experiments, new pedagogies, new curriculums, and uh, also the new the groups of learners. That's precisely what we are trying to do, you know, to enable our students to uh, tap into the world and be able to extract uh, information to networks and expand their capabilities uh, in a perpetual way, not just during their, their enrollment at a university. So uh, to proper, properly prepare the knowledge workers in the future, not only we have discipline-based uh, training, which needs to be continued, we need to close the skill gap. Uh, we need to provide a superior, refreshing learning environment, as I emphasized several times. Uh, it would be nice if we can make use of data to personalize uh, you know, the training, uh, learning content, and more, learning sequence, for example. Uh, we are obviously uh, you know, very focused on stimulating the knowledge creation, creativity, and innovation among the students, because uh, that is the future, you know, no longer just uh, competing on speed and uh, automation. And that's, you know, that's, that's all at the third industrial revolution. We are at the onset of the fourth industrial revolution. So lots of skills. Uh, our students need to be, uh, you know, to, uh, building up, uh, for example, computational intelligence, uh, social intelligence, sense-making, collaboration, transcultural knowledge, transdisciplinary knowledge, and more. Of course, you know, to, uh, we can't transfer these skills to them to, uh, overnight, but we have, again, to, have to provide an environment in all the uh, operations that we are, uh, you know, the, we are uh, organizing so that uh, they can absorb, they are exposed to uh, gaining this experience. Well, to me, it boils down to three generic categories of things that uh, we, uh, we should be doing. Well, first one is a uh, new curriculum. Curriculums are not just uh, dictated or uh, originated by teachers, but uh, students, rightly so. Uh, students and graduates and even uh, outsiders have a say in shaping that new curriculum. Second is new pedagogies. New pedagogies that uh, not only based on current uh, teaching environment, but also based on the blended and uh, virtual learning environments uh, that, uh, that, physical, uh, uh, that in physical environment, there's no equivalent. There will be examples of this later on. And of course, uh, this new learning environment which made up of uh, technology, people, uh, content, uh, assessments, and more. Now, it's not the focus of today's talk, but I would also like to uh, remind everybody, the learning environment is not just, a not just a virtual thing, you know, not just about people. It's also about a physical environment that university can build, right? And uh, I was lucky enough uh, that Polly sponsored me to uh, several universities in Europe, uh, and uh, it was an eye-opener to some of the European universities, especially those uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands and in Germany, where they have uh, developed uh, futuristic learning environments. Uh, futuristic doesn't mean that it's high tech, right? But it's a very synergistic, cozy environment that lends itself to uh, easy uh, and uh, casual uh, uh, gathering uh, and sharing uh, of knowledge in a trustworthy way. And this one is the latest that I've read. Uh, in the McLean University uh, in Pennsylvania, and they're still building it, uh, supposed to be operational by fall of 2022. Uh, in this complex that uh, you see there, there will be a uh, mock-up trading floor. There will be a, a corporate uh, 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 conference center. Uh, there will be a business incubator, uh, in addition to uh, teaching classrooms, uh, data mining laboratories, and more. 
Again, something I find to be uh, very uh, intriguing, uh, which uh, obviously uh, today I don't have time, but I'd just like to enlighten everybody so that you can uh, you can uh, look for it and you can uh, you know to, uh, and, and further it yourself. And that is this uh, you know I call it the um, um, the combination lock that's been provided by uh, uh, by two authors, uh, C. Baird and uh, J. P. Wilson, and they've got uh, you know two versions of the book, uh, both on uh, experimental learning. Uh, what uh, intriguing is this. Uh, uh, you know, the dial, uh, dials that looks like a combination lock that uh, every uh, teacher who designs a course have to pay attention to these dimensions, dimensions like uh, physical dimensions, uh, motivations, uh, emotions, uh, uh, content, uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, thinking, feeling dimensions of the, of the learner. I actually like the, um, the one in the first edition of the book uh, more. I thought this is more intuitive than the second one, but uh, anyway. Now, so for me, I'm always thinking about solutions to uh, these uh, questions. Uh, solutions like, how do we stimulate students to learn to learn in 21st century? I mean, learning is not enough. Things are moving so fast out there, they really need to uh, acquire ability of learning to learn. How can we transcend the classroom, break down the barriers, the walls, and uh, turn it into a borderless ubiquitous? and pervasive learning environment, 24 by seven by 365. How do we internationalize? Internationalize what? Our subjects, our students, our learning environment, our assessment, our content. How can we provide best in breed learning content? Is it always material that is provided by us? Is it always material that is written by us or created by us? Or there is a way that we can source best of breed material from multiple sources, yet, maintaining the coherency and the uh, uh, articulation among the various sources of content. Very tough question. How can we customize the learning experience for individual students? You know, I always try to, uh, you know, to uh, push this because, uh, you know, to whatever I do, whatever I say, like in this room here, I'm talking to, I suppose, uh, dozens of you, you know, but I'm only speaking you know, in one version. Uh, and that, uh, that version may mean more to some of you because everyone is individual, you know, uh, everyone's creative, uh, everyone's uh, uh, needs are different, right? So how can we customize the learning experience based on uh, what we want to disseminate uh, individually? And that's very tough, you know? And of course, uh, learning needs to be uh, continuous. So how do we actually, uh, you know, encourage our students to develop this, uh, this trait of uh, ongoing learning for a lifelong uh, uh, um, uh, uh, journey. Skill gaps, which I mentioned earlier, and ultimately the refreshing learning experience. Okay, so, uh, you know, to, uh, if you haven't scanned that uh, QR code, it's a, a second chance for you to scan that again, and um, you should be able to uh, see what I've shown you just in the previous page. And I would like your input on that. So, uh, you know, so for those of you who have scanned it, you can uh, locate that page immediately on your, uh, on your screen. And uh, I would uh, value that uh, in the next uh, five to 10 minutes, you enter some uh, input. If you have additional uh, things that you believe we should be paying attention to uh, by, uh, you know, to, by uh, trying to design an even better learning environment in 21st century. We do not have the solutions yet, but that doesn't mean that we cannot think. Uh, about uh, what are some of the things that we need to solve on the horizon. So I'll come back to that uh, multimedia input uh, later on. Now, um, you can say that, you know, thanks to COVID-19, it uh, accelerated nearly all universities' uh, transformation in the use of e-learning, right? Uh, definitely, uh, uh, at least, uh, you know, partially, uh, if not entirely, on uh, using more electronic means to continue with the delivery of educational services by university. But think of this E in the broader sense, you know, that this E, this electronic uh, means in the broader sense, what can uh, technology do to us in terms of education? Well, it's a lot really, right? Obviously we can store and retrieve material, we can transmit material, we can allow people to, uh, to park material at certain places and let people download the material. We can analyze the material, we can generalize the material, uh, we can uh, detect whether you know, anyone has been using some materials uh, 
with, uh, with higher, I suppose, uh, interest or frequency uh, than others. There's a lot more we can do than just transmitting and storing information, as you can see here. But sadly, you know, when I look around, when I ask around uh, colleagues and uh, academics who have been using technologies in the, in the last 18 months, especially because of uh, trying to continue their educational delivery uh, because of COVID 19's uh, seizure, then I would say that most teachers are only doing what are not called e learning, they are e teaching, right? So, uh, you know, I'm doing e-teaching right now, <laughs> uh, delivering a lecture, uh, pretty much a one-sided lecture to an audience, right? And uh, the use of the e in this case, precisely, you know, that this is a living proof of what I'm saying now, you know, uh, I'm criticizing myself as well here. And precisely, we are always using the e just to bridge two dimensions. What are these two dimensions? One is the distance dimension, geographical dimensions, the other one is the timing dimension, dimension because uh, there are people in the audience who are not in the same uh, time zone as, uh, as we are in Hong Kong, GMT plus eight. So uh, the fact that you're also online, be able to hear me instantly, you are bridging, relying on technology to bridge the timing uh, uh, um, divide. Uh, you're not in Hong Kong, you're not in uh, uh, West Kowloon here, this is where I'm broadcasting from my Poly U campus. Um, then uh, you are also bridging using technology, the geographical divide. But that's pretty much, that's it, uh, you know, compared to the previous uh, page which I show you about the technology, what technology can do, it's a far cry, it's highly inadequate, okay? So we need to come up with new ways of learning, definitely, right? So uh, I specific, specifically think about uh, four things which me and my uh, colleagues have been trying, uh, you know, for, for the last uh, three to 12 years, you know, the, the shortest one's been trying for three years, and the longest one has been trying for more than a decade. So four things uh, that uh, together, uh, individually and collectively, shed light on uh, overcoming or alleviating some of the challenges that are presented earlier. First one is a personal learning environment and network, uh, which uh, serve to uh, enforce or foster uh, ongoing peer-based social lifelong learning. I'll give uh, more elaborations later on, definitely. Second one is, uh, I consider a very exciting one, uh, together with my students and graduates, we co-create the curriculum for a subject uh, on an ongoing basis. So after this co-creation, uh, come next year when I deliver a subject, some of the content may need to be updated as long as the learning outcome is not, uh, is not changed. So it's wonderful that, uh, that we uh, can incorporate this input from, uh, from our learners. The third one is, uh, you know, trying to address the best of breed uh, content for our students and for ourselves, the use of uh, or the increasing use of open educational resources, OER material. So uh, and make no mistake, you know, the massive open online courses, MOOCs, they are also part of OERs, okay, together with many other things. Uh, OERs definition is quite uh, wide open. We'll come into that uh, later on, maybe half an hour later. And then uh, again, um, my latest, uh, you know, the, uh, project is uh, the Global Classrooms, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, in view of COVID-19, all international travel, physical travel is basically uh, or very much uh, prohibited. Uh, and that means uh, for most universities, uh, the students, uh, you know, the access to internationalization or gaining internationalization experience has been severely uh, diminished. However, you know, to think more dynamically, there are many ways that we can uh, help our students to regain uh, and even achieve more this internationalization experience without any travel, right? And I call this internationalization at home. And uh, me and some of our colleagues at PolyU have tried that with uh, very exciting results. So all that uh, will come in the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes. So here we go, the, the four things that, um, uh, that I've just uh, summarized earlier and we go through them to, uh, one by one. Well, the, um, this is a good picture similar to this classroom here. Uh, you know, the traditional uh, uh, lecture room, everybody knows, uh, and uh, uh, a professor in front is delivering a, uh, a class to the students, and it's all very ordinary. I'm not sure about um, the HKCC here, but at PolyU, after a few rounds of uh, classroom uh, renovations, uh, the large classrooms, in fact, uh, have a guess. You think that uh, we have more large classrooms, the same or less? In fact, we have less uh, 
uh, large classrooms. Why? Because, uh, you know, we observe students are, you know, breaking up and learning in groups. They find every space that they can find in the university to, uh, you know, to, to, to discuss together. The last classroom lecture where we still need in some cases, right? Uh, but uh, in overall speaking, the, the need has been very much uh, diminished, right? So therefore, uh, classrooms uh, are made being smaller. But that's not the solution. Uh, that's not the total solution to the problem. Everybody knows, you know, uh, it's not a trade secret, I suppose. Delivering the lectures, uh, you know, the, we, uh, all of us here in, in, as teachers are professionals. Delivering three hours, six hours, or even nine hours a day, um, you know, the, is still uh, possible. But that's not the way to enable people to learn. You know, the, we must uh, break it up with active learning. Uh, besides, there's a lot of problems, at least for me, in uh, keeping up with uh, lectures, especially about uh, refreshing the content. Because uh, you know, uh, every semester we've got 13 weeks, we have all aligned it. Week one, I'm gonna teach this. Week two, I'm gonna teach this. So what happened if uh, at week five, there's no new information that is related to what I have taught in week two and week three? Well, technically, uh, I don't have time for it. I have to wait until next year. And next year, you know, we're kind of busy. We never forget, sorry, we never remember to uh, you know, incorporate in content. So uh, that business cycle continues. And uh, unfortunately, that's not uh, going to do our students uh, any good, obviously. So something needs to change, needs to change radically. Learning needs to be beyond the classroom and uh, not in a large classroom, a larger capacity. Equally speaking, learning is not uh, clearly not confined to uh, using a learning management system. Um, well, I, I suppose, uh, you know, my colleagues at PolyU are using the, uh, uh, the Blackboard, the learning management system for... Uh, for filing and downloading files for discussion uh, bulletin boards, uh, for marking, for assessments, for communication with students, uh, for uh, dissemination of uh, feedback and so forth, for uh, grade center, for uh, you know the calculation of marks uh, and uh, uh, ranking the marks based on the, uh, the rubric and so forth. But still, you know, the, uh, learning is not uh, is not uh, should not be done in that way. I mean, what I've described with the learning management system there that's too teacher-centric rather than uh, learner-directed. So that's not the way to go as well. Back to, you know, to our uh, perception of, uh, of the, uh, um, you know, ubiquitous and heavily connected uh, networks out there in the 21st century. How are we going to enable our students to make use of these networks so that they can learn better in addition to learning to, from the teacher in the classroom and in addition to learning from the peers in the classroom and also outside the classroom? This is another way to, uh, to, to look at it. You know, with these networks, uh, you think more. What are in these networks? Well, uh, I would say that uh, there's obviously data, there's data, information, uh, documents, uh, books, and so forth, uh, papers, you know, publications uh, in these networks. There's more. There are people in this network. Why? Because there are software in this network and people have signed up to use this software, especially social networking software. And people also build up their own networks as well, especially if they're using a professional networking or social networking software. They have their own uh, trusted circle. They have their own uh, fans. They have their own supporters, right? So the, 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 um, you know, the, the digital world has a lot of connections and these connections translate into you know, the connections between people and documents, connections between documents, connections between people and people. These are all very valuable uh, connections that we should be making use of. And I would say that, in fact, knowledge resides in the network. We have to help our students to, uh, to spot and harness the knowledge in this network to build and expand the professional capability uh, with integrity and trust through this network. So the personal learning environment is uh, one of these tools that helps to uh, alleviate uh, several things. Firstly, it's the information overload, and secondly, is to help them to uh, help students and learners to develop a lifelong learning trait. And thirdly, it's also uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, to uh, enable information to come to us automatically, rather than we have to constantly spend time on searching for information. Now, uh, before I talk about uh, this concept, uh, perhaps uh, some very simple uh, uh, description about uh, what we described by a push versus pull in terms of information retrieval, all right? So if we have a need for a piece of information, 
uh, like some of you now, uh, looking at your mobile phone, maybe using a you know the search tool to search for something. You are actually executing a step for pool. You are pulling information from the internet, from the universe, and then coming into your browser. Right? You have to think about the keywords. You have to think about uh, what search engine you use, and hopefully it is powerful. And hopefully what you find or what you're looking for appears in the first few pages. Right? All right. Well, that's uh, that's cool, and uh, everyone is uh, very familiar with that. But of course, you know, computers are very powerful. You know, to, we can, uh, through a set of uh, very simple commands, we can direct computers to do the searching for us 24 by seven by 365, right? Why don't we do that? You know, to set up the alert subscriptions, automatic, uh, you know, to informed by uh, computers so that uh, whenever something that uh, we have declared our interest in and with permission that we can see it, then uh, why don't we get the computer to alert us about, right? This is uh, a solution to, for example, if you see something on the website, on a particular page, on the internet, and you find it interesting, what's your normal behavior? You bookmark it or are you a favorite, right? Okay, well, tell yourself, you don't need to tell me, how often you actually go back to the bookmarks and check them? Sometimes, sometimes you may be too busy, sometimes forgotten, right? So why don't we uh, do it the other way in terms of relying on us, which are not very reliable, at least for me, right? Why don't we use technology to look for new information in those areas, similar to what we have declared our interest and then bring that information to me. So if you understand that, we are talking about the pull versus push information, right? So most of the time we are using the pull method, but we should be using the push method as well. So the personal learning environment network is precisely a tool that helps us to do the push uh, using technology. We don't have to uh, spend much time on it. Once set up, it's automatic. Once I set it up, I only need to recalibrate by setting new keywords and so forth. Uh, maybe once every few months, but uh, no big deal. So what's the design rationale? You know, to allow me to use, uh, continue to use cartoons to enlighten everybody. So imagine this uh, little girl is a teacher, all right? So there's a legend on the bottom there, there's a teacher. So in today's work, uh, she reads a lot of information. A lot of information come through her inbox, uh, come through her desk and so forth. Uh, too much, you know, she has to store this information. Sometimes cannot even cope with it. Well, she got friends uh, in her address book, in her email box, and uh, her friends may also share her information. So. Uh, Ultimately, you know, whether she read it or not, some of the information uh, may, be, uh, may be lost, maybe not indexed. That some of the information may somehow get collected on a USB, on a shared drive, or uh, as uh, bookmarks or whatever, right? So this is uh, inadvertently already her own uh, personal uh, uh, learning environment. Everyone is different, of course. Well, all right, uh, then we turn to this boy, another cartoon, and assuming that this boy is a student, well, in fact, uh, you know, through a day's uh, work, uh, this boy's uh, encounter is not much different from the teacher, except that uh, he or she will receive a different type of information from other students, from his peers, and so forth. So, uh, like it or not, every one of us, every day, receive a lot of information, and we are already trying to cope with some of this information and put it in our own personal learning environment. If we extend it further, each one of you, at any point in time, in a day, in a week, at any fraction of time, you belong to some circle. Now, so for those of you who are attending the seminar now, between now and 5 p.m., you belong to the circle of this QESS 7, right? After that, you may go back to your own circle. I don't know, maybe a special interest club. I don't know. Maybe a, um, a, a, a gym uh, that you have to go, uh, uh, and uh, or maybe a social function that you have, uh, you know, to, uh, organized with your with your friends and so forth. So at any point in time, uh, we belong to uh, one of these uh, circles. In some circles, we are the leader. In some circle, I'm the professor. In some circle, I'm the learner. In some circle, I'm the beginner, right? So I've been thinking about, uh, this is oh, 12 years ago, thinking about, uh, you know, me and my students, you know, how can we create an environment, a virtual environment, so that uh, with the minimum tools, how can we enable everyone can communicate, can collaborate, can share information and discuss this good idea, you know, to, and hopefully these things can survive even after the students have finished the semester, even after they have graduated. 
Well, welcome to the personal learning environment. So, uh, you want to draw a little bit here, you know, to, uh, for example. Oh, okay. This little uh, boy, a student, he could be using the LinkedIn and Gmail, and this uh, graduate can be using the LinkedIn, and um, this is the Flickr. As well, um, this um, student, not a good draw, of course, can be using Twitter and Symbolu. All right, so you got the idea, you know, the, there's uh, absolutely, uh, you know, extremely high flexibility as to what sort of Web 2.0 tools that you would like to use, provided that all of us install uh, two common components. I suppose two common components is not uh, too demanding. So you can see that with this environment, at PolyU, I've set up the four main groups of, of people to collaborate. Teachers, students, graduates, and also selective guests, typically uh, visiting lecturers and people who have given the, um, the uh, uh, guest lecture so that uh, students can also further learn from these people. So we evaluate a lot of uh, Web 2.0 tools because they are, they are free and they are powerful. They, are, they promote sharing by all parties, by directional sharing. And it's gone through different cycles. Uh, so for now, to, uh, after 12 years of evolution, to, uh, we, uh, we are now using, to, uh, for example, an RSS reader. Uh, it can be uh, several of them. Uh, actively, we are trying with uh, Feedly, F-E-D-L-Y, and InnoReader, okay? And a discussion forum called Miwi. But it can be, you know, it can be Facebook with uh, other readers as well. Okay, so what's a reader? You know, what's an RS reader? And I suppose uh, some of you, when you browse websites, some of you you may have seen a symbol like this before. Right, that symbol means that uh, that website is broadcasting, broadcasting new information. So uh, that's precisely, you know, instead of me going to check my bookmark regularly to see when it new information. When a website is broadcasting new information, a link with that new information is being sent to a browser, which I can keep it. I can keep it for live, you know, theoretically. So uh, I help my students to set this up. Uh, and uh, the, the way to do it, it's really simple. I have a five to six pages uh, configuration guide. Uh, and I have a set of pre-selected feeds. I suppose that's the role of the teacher, right? Because uh, when a student first learn about the subject, you have to help them, you know. We have to apply our professional judgment and help the students to identify or let the student know which are the quality sources, you know, unbiased sources, non-commercial sources, quality sources that they should learn from. So we selected this feed and packaged together. And then I also have the videos on YouTube showing them how they can actually, uh, you know, to create their own personal learning environment using the designated software and then import the feeds and get it operational. And for the last 12 years, I've never had anyone who cannot configure it, put it this way. So usually they can get it done in uh, anything between five to 15 minutes. And the result is wonderful because uh, everybody knows if we use a discussion board, okay, but discussion board eventually, eventually, usually what happened? It will be reduced to a pound of nothing, right? Inactivity, right? And students are always waiting for the teacher to, uh, to, to post something and um, they have no incentive to contribute or whatever. But the PLEN, it's a half bulletin board uh, because it's a semi-automatic bulletin board because with the RSS, which is the push technology, new information comes in every day, every minute, right? So here is a, 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 you know, a snapshot of uh, one of the readers showcasing, you know, what are the new articles? Every night I spend about uh, half an hour to 45 minutes going through the PLEN, uh, the articles, and, uh, you know, setting off some and to some of my students, sharing with them. I also read the ones that they share with me as well. So sharing, uh, annotating, reposting, uh, and also alerts from uh, YouTube and other places. Uh, and then with our with our uh, scrutiny, with our trust, it makes a lot of sense because collectively we help to combat the information overload. Now, 
this will be two events, which I won't talk about, uh, but if you are seriously interested, of course, you know, the, when we add these feeds, uh, theoretically, we're adding more information. You know, you can say that, look, the, aren't you, Professor, by doing that, you are adding to the information overload? Well, yes and no. So when there's really too much information coming in through this feed, we can apply filters. So, for example, if you are teaching marketing, you can look for those feeds on marketing, but there's too much, too overwhelming. So I want to restrict, I only want to receive articles that talk about marketing in Asia, uh, that talked about these companies and from these sources, right? And I want to only want to read the last six uh, of, of today, all right? You can do that, okay? So uh, that's to do with filters. I use MeWe, um, I think it's almost like a, um, a, a, um, a vanilla version of the Facebook, to, uh, uh, with much simpler controls and uh, social networking too to uh, to foster the discussion. So this is where where the RSS articles with annotation being posted into there by my students, by my graduates, and myself. Now this semi-automatic bulletin board, uh, I appreciate it very much because now you can see that the whole class, together with some graduate, together with uh, external practitioners, are looking at the content, right? The whole class are collectively inputting material into there. Students can learn from what other people have posted. Students can learn from what other people have commented. I can see what other students have commented and be able to cast my judgment as to what are their interests, what are their um, you know, hot buttons, what are the areas that they need more help, or what are the areas they seem to master quite well. And last but not least, together, we are also helping each other uh, full trust because we're in a class to combat information overload. If I operate it myself, I may have to read 200 articles a day. Come on, to be honest, I would never be able to read 200 articles a day, right? But I have 60 students, right? And they also read and contribute some of the articles. So I only need to read, well, I, I, I shouldn't, but I focus on reading the ones that my students are talking about so that together, Maybe I only need to read about 20 or 30 rather than 200 a day. It's not perfect, but what is perfect? Screen sharing has stopped. Can we share screen again? Can you confirm it's okay? All right, back on, is that right? Okay, good, wonderful. So, uh, you know, I can use the PLEM to catch up with my lectures, should I say? Because as I said, you know, in week five, something came along to, in the newspaper, in the papers, in the library, that shed light on something that I'll talk about in earlier weeks of the semester. Well, I can put it in there and the students can catch up, you know, to, they, can, to, they can read, uh, uh, you know, to, whenever they have time to catch up with what uh, I otherwise would not be able to cover. And that's wonderful. Now, to, you must be, uh, asking, you know, it's a burning question. Why would students contribute, right? So yes, to be honest, I give them a 10% assessment mark. And this is the, uh, the assessment rubric, you know, to, uh, if they set up the PLEM, they already get 10% of 10%. <clears throat> if they have a handful, yes. All right, good day. Thank you. So uh, I give them a, a rubric that uh, shows them you know, uncertain terms, how do they get marks? It's a component that a student can get, uh, can control their own marks, put it this way, right? So uh, if they set up the PLEN just by following the guidelines, they get 10% of 10%. If they uh, have handful contributions during semester, they get 20%. And all the way up, if they are regular contributions every week, that's a lot, you know? <laughs> I could be reading an essay from uh, every student. <laughs> Uh, every week, uh, they get 100%, all right? So uh, I've run that for many years and the result is spectacular. Spectacular, uh, not just because, uh, you know, many students are joining, but also as an indicator of, uh, of a predictor of the final grade of the student. I'll show you. Look at that, uh, collecting the uh, aggregating uh, uh, results from uh, several uh, subjects over several years as well. Look at that, uh, the PLEN is 10% of the marks and uh, students have to contribute consistently 
throughout 13 weeks of the semester. So they can, cannot cram it, cannot leave it until the last week. Because the last week, no matter how much you contribute, you only get one week mark, okay? So I think it's a very strong correlation between the marks they get you know, out of 10 to what the final grade is. And this is wonderful. And this is only a 10% of the marks, right? So it shows to me, or it convinces me, that uh, those who uh, understand what this is, those who appreciate that this is a tool that actually help them to learn, not only just to get marks in the class, are uh, those uh, students who are more mature in the thinking and uh, therefore um, their tactics, their learning strategies and their learning outcomes seem to be better, a lot better than others. And this can be uh, early uh, indicated by the use of this tool. All right, by now, I think the uh, benefits is obvious. You don't, need the, you don't need me to read it out to you. You know, to, uh, it helps them to, uh, to gain a, a practical dimension about uh, what the uh, theoretical content are, and it uh, prepares them better to face the world for lifelong learning. And through uh, using the PLEN, they also develop better networking skills and digital literacy skills, among many other things. Student feedback has been uh, excellent. Uh, many students have commented that, uh, in fact, the PLEN has uh, overwhelmed them and uh, enabled them to learn beyond what the syllabus have uh, have covered. And I'm very uh, uh, very happy with uh, with this um, lower answer. And that is when when we ask them, you know, now the semester is over, would you like to be taken off the PLEN? And uh, 93 to 95 percent say that uh, put me there, and uh, they remain to be there. And I can tell you that about 10% of the students continue to use it after the semester and even after their graduate. Of course, you know, you have to continue to evolve because uh, these kind of uh, Google and Web 2.0 tools, they are never the same. Well, after one or two years, you have to switch to another tool. And as reason that uh, this last semester, I also have uh, very good feedback again, and just to show you that um, my students appreciate it very much and they found that uh, this is a very refreshing experience and also opened up a completely new dimension for them to learn, not only from me, not only from the network, but also from their peers. <clears throat> right, what we learned from the PLEN is, uh, you know, the collect collective wisdom is power and uh, trust the network can be further leveraged on and the teacher's role needs to be gradually changed. Uh, Instead of continuing to do lectures, lectures, and lectures, teachers have to spend more time on locating quality material and facilitating an environment for students to learn. We have to pay more attention to what students are discussing and from there, try to gauge their difficulties and challenges and be able to address them incrementally. Well, we're going to uh, the second, uh, well, Another challenge, well, the challenge is uh, how can we prepare our students to face an increasingly uh, challenging and uncertain world? No easy question here, of course. No easy answer here, I'm sorry. Difficult question, right? So, uh, you know, how can we uh, enable our students to be able to better cope with this constantly changing society, especially with uh, rapid development of uh, some uh, business and technological topics? <clears throat> And my answer there, together with some of my colleagues, uh, is uh, yeah, how can we enable students to co-create content and curriculum, you know, to, uh, in class and also during the semester. And then to, uh, we will uh, look at uh, what they have actually created and then see whether the curriculum needs to be updated marginally, incrementally. So this is one of the subjects that I teach. And for example, I put out these questions, not example, these are real, you know, I've used it for three years already. So one of the questions is, uh, how will business process management and uh, robotic process automation develop in the next three years? I suppose this is a fair question. PPM has been uh, very popular for the last 10 years anyway, uh, uh, ranking in the top five of uh, IT investments. Um, uh, 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 repetitively, uh, and robotic process automation is also uh, uh, in the rise, and at least in the last two years. So uh, 
you know, the, um, how will these two feel played out? Yeah, will they merge? Will they go in different directions? And uh, what are their collective impact to, uh, to the business and uh, workflow world? Well, if you ask me, I told my student, I don't know the answer. Well, that don't ask me, we need to be uh, further research. <clears throat> further research is right. You know, uh, we've developed this uh, five-step method that enables students to generate scenarios. Uh, now, firstly, at the, um, at the, uh, uh, at the high level, uh, if you look at these uh, five steps, uh, I mean, very simple, you know, I teach students how to do scenarios. They go away at half the semester, go to a library, go to do research, and then finally generate those scenarios. I'll show you what those scenarios are in the scenario generation process. But uh, number five is very interesting because number five is uh, uh, after the students have submitted the scenarios, uh, create a repository. Uh, now with three years, I have thousands of these in the repository. And I have to look at uh, these scenarios, which address the questions I gave them, the priming question. And I have to continue to assess whether any of, the, any of these scenarios are becoming true or part of it is becoming true. Because if that's the case, that's a good time to, to alert myself and my colleagues that we have to update the subject. We have to update the subject. You know, it's like a, uh, it's like a parallel equivalent to outcome-based education, right? It enables a mechanism, a systematic mechanism for our learning objective, for our learning content, for our curriculum to be, up, uh, to be updated. So co-creation is wonderful. Students feel very, very excited about, about that, although uh, their good work doesn't get uh, realized until the next year, right? I joke to them saying that if you want to see how the course has been changed, you have to fail yourself so that you can retake it next year. <laughs> right, so exactly how do we do it? Uh, of course, uh, you know, this is another five or six hours uh, seminar, but uh, just make it simple. Uh, we uh, train them how to look for trends and driving forces. And through that, they become a more international, uh, internationalized view about what the big pictures are happening in the rest of the world. And uh, they have to look at uh, probabilities uh, uh, to assess the likelihood of uh, some of those uh, trends becoming true and impacting us. How would they impact us? They have to assess about the uncertainty and uh, significance of the impact. They have to draw matrices to identify which are the likely, most likely uh, scenarios to be developed? Uh, what are the inhibitors and the facilitators for these scenarios to be true? And then tell a story about how that scenario will pan out. So uh, through that step, they do learn about uh, a number of uh, very uh, interesting things, I should say. So I won't play, uh, you know, the whole thing, but uh, just. Uh, uh, a, uh, an extract for some of the, um, the workshop, uh, because in the last two years with COVID-19, uh, we cannot conduct these workshops uh, in, uh, in person. Uh, instead, uh, it's wonderful. It enables us to develop a new version of this. So we can now conduct these workshops, scenario development workshops, uh, both in person or online. So this is one of the discussions that the students presenting about what are the driving forces and trends that they have identified. For our group, we mainly focused about um, trends relating to like technology. So um, in our brainstorming, you can see like use of robots, um, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Um, but we also focused on like privacy concerns. So for example, mm. advancements in data encryption. Informally for our group, we mainly focused about uh, remotely control uh, their businesses. The second thing we talked about is about how artificial intelligence will affect customer support. So it's personal digital assistance and natural uh, language process um, our assistant in our- Okay, that illustrates the point. The point is uh, through this, I am, I am uh, very pleased because I get to hear about, in fact, my students know a lot more than what I have covered or have not covered in the course. The students are utilizing their general knowledge uh, through additional research to justify why they consider some of these trends are impactful to, to the primary questions and they're providing justifications. I think that's, that's wonderful. That's a lot more valuable than me giving a one side lecture, right? So uh, I'm gonna do more of this. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the students have-, uh, have impressed The society will be living in after it. For these uh, sharing. And at the end of the uh, semester, when they submit the scenarios, I also ask them to uh, record a video uh, 
about uh, what they have actually learned. So very briefly, I can also show a part of it about the scenario. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my scenarios. The objective question discussed in this video is how will search evolve in the next three years? There are various factors will influence the future. Based on the important and uncertain principle, we choose these two uncertainties to drive the plot of my scenario. The X of uncertainty, degree of AI implementation captures the contrast. Okay, I think you got a taste of it, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I, I talked about search, but uh, never to this level of details. So all these uh, background research elaboration about uh, the future uh, direction of search technologies were co uh, coordinated uh, by the student, reasoned by the student with, uh, with arguments supported by her own research. So it's, it's wonderful. You know, uh, we enlighten the student and inspire them to do, and they choose a topic and through this scenario development techniques, uh, they showcase that uh, they can do, they can practice and do more research and be able to use data to support their arguments and come up with the scenarios. So I also uh, create a pool of these uh, videos so that uh, students can uh, uh, can watch other students' student, uh, uh, output as well. As I said, uh, I have been operating this uh, this methodology for at least three years, and uh, you can see that on average, uh, uh, either for curiosity uh, or for other reasons, uh, each student on average watch another thirty videos by other students. Each video is only five minutes, right? Uh, because especially if I tell them that uh, look. You have to produce a video, and uh, they don't know exactly what the what that video is supposed to to have. And I give them a a, a pointer to uh, replaying the videos from the previous uh, class. So uh, many of them actually did, and uh, we play some of the videos from the previous class. That's the matrix. I told my students, you will never be measured about based on the accuracy of your scenario, because uh, even Bill Gates will get it, will not get it right, right? But I will measure you based on the coherency, the background research, your use of quality data, your reasoning, right? And your presentation of these scenarios. What do they learn? They learn how to do background research. They learn how to apply critical thinking, not only just on their own, but also together with their peers. They learn how to collaborate with other students, right? To discuss, to present the arguments. They also learn how to use various collaboration tools, right? To, uh, in order to, uh, to, to further and, and uh, work out the deliverables. Because uh, you know, the last two years, this was uh, during the COVID-19 uh, 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 times. Oh, I recently have an article in the Times uh, Higher Education. So uh, for those of you who are interested, I can send you the link or I can give you that PowerPoint. There's a link to uh, an article in the Times Higher Education on this. I'm not the only person doing co-creation. Uh, Robert Wright, uh, Dr. Robert Wright from uh, MM at PolyU. Uh, I'm also uh, very admiring about his work. Uh, and uh, years and years ago, he is already asking his students to record, you know, I think it's a one minute uh, video with uh, top directors in uh, Hong Kong and then uh, put all this into a internet repository so that other students can also watch it, right? So it's great that uh, you use this effort to, to co-create content with the students. Well, OER, uh, Open Educational Resources, it's, uh, as the word uh, uh, mentioned, it's already being uh, targeted as one of the strategic teaching and learning goals of PolyU in the next uh, seven years. Well, not six, seven, next five and a half years. We are into the, uh, the second year of the, uh, of the uh, seven year strategic plan. What is OER? Well, again, that may uh, take the rest of the day to explain it. Uh, in general, it can be as wide as anything that is uh, in the open domain on the internet that doesn't require a password and you can download it. That is already open educational resources. So strictly speaking, you can, you can say that uh, the, uh, the, the articles being shared by my students uh, in the uh, personal learning environment, they are OER material already. But OER is uh, you know, a very exciting thing. It doesn't, con doesn't cover just uh, documents. It can cover methodologies. It can cover a technique. You can cover electronic learning objects. You can also cover, you know, the, a way of doing things, a design artifact, for example, that can also be OER. Now, most people, uh, you know, the, don't see OER as two dimensions. I see them as two dimensions. Well, there's people who create the OER, 
you know, uh, you create the OER, uh, which is a, a book that you uh, present to the rest of the world, you may download it, all right, uh, give it away. Or you can use a material on the internet that is designated as OER and incorporate into your own teaching. So to me, there are two dimensions, create or consume, or create and consume, okay? So if you are not confident yet, you probably will start with the consume part. And if you are an expert, you would like to share your groundbreaking uh, uh, approach to, uh, to the rest of the world, with the rest of the world, you probably will go down the create path, okay? You can do both as well. What are some of the uh, uh, obvious uh, uh, repositories for uh, downloading, locating OER material? I suppose one of the very first one is the uh, MIT OpenCourseWare, uh, where there's a huge repository of videos and lecture notes by MIT professors on just about any topic that you can imagine, right? It's been there for more than 10 years with updates, of course. Podio Library has also developed an OER portal. It's a meta search engine that allows uh, you to search any user to search for OER materials internationally, as well as those OER materials, typically the last uh, final non-copyright version of PortU staff publication uh, in the uh, library as well. So they, they call it an OER portal. Merlot is also a big one, uh, started by one of the universities in uh, California. Uh, and uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Henry Chen from Computing uh, is a good friend with the president of Merlot. Merlot has got an increasing and growing, rapidly growing uh, repository of, uh, of, uh, of OER material. You can't, uh, you can't bypass it if you are you know, to, uh, wanting to check out the OER material. Then personally, I also find this uh, Canadian uh, uh, initiative very useful. It's the Open uh, Textbook Library, uh, and uh, it's also a meta engine, which contains a lot of books and OER, and I've actually used, uh, downloaded, located, downloaded, and used some books in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship, which I believe is very good uh, to be used as OER material. Still a growing area with OER, and based on uh, latest US statistics, the latest I can find is 2019, uh, definitely the science and social sciences area uh, have more content than others, but uh, as I said, uh, uh, the uh, the traffic and the buildup is uh, is rapidly increasing. So uh, you have to check regularly to see uh, the area that you're teaching in, the books and the resources they are locating. Uh, maybe uh, soon, maybe it's already now available. Well, the key thing is, uh, you know, why would we like to consider using OER? Well, it's it's available already, and if you choose it, it must be good, it must be appropriate, right? So it saves you a lot of effort. It saves students uh, the hassle of uh, buying it. They can download it instantly, okay? And an important thing about OER is uh, that usually there's a community behind it. There's a community of people with expertise, with care, looking after that, uh, that content. So you can tap into that community for, uh, for asking questions, for help, and also for knowledge sharing. Well, again, you know, to, uh, as, uh, as the teacher, as the academic, uh, we are you know, tasked with the responsibility of uh, applying our professional judgment on these things. What's the quality, quality relevancy, <clears throat> uh, the authenticity, the source of this material? Is it durable? Is it being looked after? Is it being updated, right? And uh, how applicable is this material is? If I incorporate them, does it help me to uh, you know, fill a few holes in my, uh, in my learning content? Is it very specialized or is it very general? And again, uh, we don't have time to talk about that today. Uh, what about the licensing? You know, make no mistake. There could be more specific license. License may say that, look, you can download it. You must acknowledge. Um, you must not change anything in there. Or you can use it for commercial reasons or you cannot use it for commercial reasons. Okay. So there's a, uh, a creative common license uh, 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 <coughs> uh, brand uh, associate with the uh, with the various conditions that uh, an OER material can or cannot be used. So very quickly, uh, what do you do with OER? You can either substitute by not using other content. So use the OER as the one that you want to use. You can mix the OER material with your own content, with other content, provided that you don't infringe the, uh, the uh, imposed copyright uh, uh, requirement. 
you can extend what you already have with an OER component, which you don't have, and that's probably the big gain for you in terms of speed and ease. And you can also tag, index the material, right? So that people can also locate this material, you and your students, when they look for, uh, I don't know, uh, selected readings, additional sources of, uh, of uh, study. So maybe I'll show uh, one of these, uh, you know, the case in point is uh, I was developing my second book, Massive Open Online course on Industry 4.0. Now, obviously, uh, you know, talked about industrial revolutions and uh, no price for guessing. In, uh, in module one, I would have to cover the various industrial revolutions, right? Now, I'm not historian. Uh, it was gonna take me a long time if I have to read many books and talk about the first and second generation industrial revolution. So are there any material appropriate out there? I found in the YouTube, there are many videos on industrial revolution. Wow, too many to choose. Eventually, eventually I choose the one by British Museum, right? And I, uh, you know, uh, I do a summary of it. I do a uh, introduction to it, and then I link up my content with the uh, with the uh, British Museum YouTube video without changing any part of it because the copyright doesn't allow me to touch it. Well, I thought British Museum British Museum would satisfy the constraint. Why? Because it's authoritative, right? It's substantial. Um, it's got a good name, and surely there must be someone looking after it, right? So let's go, let's, let's see part of it. <clears throat> Suppose we can access the internet from this PC. Now that was very much about the first industrial revolution. Coming to the second industrial revolution, Many may recall that uh, Henry Ford, you know, the, the great uh, car manufacturer. So I do uh, an introduction. A symbol of the second industrial revolution. A summary. And then, um, I think wrong about that. The, the railroad development station and personalization. We end our seven part exploration of. I enjoy watching it and I'm sure you do as well. So please. We end our seven-part exploration right, so, of see, the Industrial the Revolution by moving to, uh, into what can be called the this. Uh, the uh, video on uh, YouTube. So um, I hope it uh, works quite well because um, that's what the, um, the feedback I get from my book learners. <laughs> All right, so uh, I mean, there are different ways that you can use OER uh, similar, to, uh, similar to the personal learning environment. I use it to... Uh, uh, to invite my students to submit OER materials and I give them marks for it. And then for those OER materials that are good, I incorporate that, uh, uh, I, I consider incorporate that in the next delivery. Same for, uh, for my MOOC learners, I invite them to submit uh, OER material for me as well. And uh, if I consider that to be good material, I give them credit and I deliver, I, I beef up the material to be included in the next delivery. Remember, our students and graduates can be the eyes and ears of our subject. So I mentioned about uh, Dr. Chen uh, and uh, Dr. Chen from Computing. He's, uh, he's got very good relationship with the Merlot uh, uh, repository, uh, but not only that, uh, he also ran competitions on OER. And last year he ran two competitions uh, with PolyU students and students are invited to uh, create OER. It'd be a bit tough. Students are, all invite, are also invited to recommend OER, right? So they get a prize for it. And of course, in order to uh, win, students will have to satisfy certain criteria. You know, a, if you're recommending OER, you have to justify why that is good, why it's not biased, and how is it linked to the course, right? How does it add value to the course and where it should be inserted and so forth. So if you want more of that criteria, I'm sure I can uh, share that with you because I'm also in part of the uh, uh, judging team uh, set up by, uh, by Dr. Chan. Well, by use of OER, I also collected feedback from students and the results have been uh, very positive, as you can see. Uh, students are considered to be a refreshing dimension. And in particular, I, uh, I thank my students for their suggestions. They said that, Professor, you should also not only provide OER, but you should also uh, you know, to redirect some of your assignments uh, and assessments based on the OER material. So I'm gonna try that in the coming semester. All 
Okay, I was thinking that should I, or maybe I'll finish this one there and then uh, we have a break, okay? Now, <clears throat> internationalization, um, the biggest sufferer during COVID-19 because international travel has been uh, pretty much uh, suspended, right? So internationalization at home is uh, trying to cover elements of internationalization without needing to travel, without needing to travel by the student, without needing to travel by the teacher, without needing to travel by the foreign students as well. You know, how can we do that? Well, we can uh, try a number of dimensions, right? Uh, if your course is already using a, a book offered by an overseas person, you can say that that's already internalization. If your course have uh, students from overseas sitting in the same classroom, well, you can also say that you're already doing internalization at home, but not enough, you know, especially with COVID-19 because most of the students do not have, well, nearly all of the students, including the teacher, do not have opportunity to travel. So how can we enable make use of this uh, you know, mishap and turn it into an opportunity for, for everybody to gain uh, you know, the international exposure. And that's uh, precisely what we have done. You know, during COVID-19, these pictures were taken during COVID-19. <laughs> There's nobody walking on campus. Student exchange program, nobody <laughs> as well. So uh, writing is on the wall, you know, to, uh, all universities, not just Poly U, every university's head is scratching the head, you know, how can we enable internalization during COVID-19? You know, to, uh, we have to wait until uh, the border controls have been lifted too slow. No, we have to start doing something. Well, how about, uh, you know, to, um, we bring the world to us if we can go, cannot go to the rest of the world. What does it mean, you know? It means precisely that, okay? Now, so I've been uh, tossing around with the, uh, with the uh, learner's dimension here in order to enable our students to mix with other learners, you know, without needing to travel outside of Hong Kong. How do we do that? In fact, it's very simple. We're already doing that, right? Right now, I'm doing a hybrid class, right? Before, maybe I was doing an online class. Where do we broadcast? Who do we broadcast to typically? to poly U students. Well, have you ever considered we can also broadcast to a university and its students in another country? Anyone who has got the link is supposed to be able to, right? So think about this, you know, you share your link, you share your class with, uh, pre-arranged of course, with class of another university, right? And so immediately in the virtual plus the physical environment, we have a linked global classroom, right? And uh, it's amazing things that we can do in this global classroom. Uh, what they have tried, I've tried uh, asking the professor or the lecturer at the other end. Uh, he give half a lecture, I give half a lecture. I ask the student at the other end and part of you students, we do role play. You know, you group ask questions, we answer. We group ask questions, you answer. We set the same assignment and ask students in both university to tackle the same assignment. Okay, make it simple. The lecturer respectively mark their own assignment but afterwards, we compare and see whether the student perspective are the same or are there any cultural divide. And then the most ambitious thing that we're going to try, uh, and we have tried, is to uh, set projects where we demand students from each university to join in each team. Right? There must be a mix of students from one of those universities. Right? And now we throw them into the deep end because they have to tackle the same project, irrespective of time difference, and they have to deliver a common deliverable. And, uh, you know, I don't need to say more because, uh, you know, your, your blood pressure will be running high because this is uh, very, very exciting. So this is the concept of the global class world. Benefits a lot, you know, bring forward and broader international exposure while there's no travel, right? All students, not just the one who has the opportunity to travel overseas in normal times, but all students, would have deep appreciation with international culture and with working with students from a different group. I especially, I mean, not, not a kind of uh, uh, discrimination, it's more a kind of differentiation. Uh, because of Hong Kong's time zone and because of the East-West cultural divide, I deliberately broke a collaboration with European universities and also South African universities. 
I, I love to book a university in Australia, where my home country is, but the timing is too punishing. Because 6.30 Hong Kong time is uh, 9.30 p.m. their time. <laughs> All right, so there are challenges. All right, so anyway, the, I think you can easily, uh, uh, you know, appreciate these uh, advantages. So there are many ways, you know, if you think about uh, having joint lectures in real time, that is just the beginning, right? We can have joint lectures. We can have a dialogue between students in real time. We can have a panel discussion. We can have role play between different groups of students. We can have question and answering and more. You know, so your mind is your limit of the imagination. So I gave a lecture to uh, Arizona State University on uh, Eastern culture to a class on, uh, uh, on business uh, uh, management and, um, uh, and MBA. And uh, they appreciate it very much because uh, they never have a treatment about uh, a, a, an Asian talking about the Eastern culture, about the line of authority, uh, the Eastern way of doing things, uh, decision making and respect. And my uh, colleague, uh, Grace Nye from computing, and you may recall that she was uh, uh, a few years ago, to, uh, the UGC teaching award uh, winner and she did wonderful things and she went through the effort of teaming up with a class at uh, University of Maryland in the east coast of America. You can see that on the left hand side. So you can even merge 12, 10, 10 of the 12 weeks of um, poly U semester time with uh, the UMD curriculum and be able to have common lectures with the students between the two uh, universities. Uh, so it's wonderful. To, uh, you know, truly, uh, you know, it's a living proof of what I've just said there. Okay, so, uh, so what about if the timing doesn't, doesn't look right? Well, uh, it's not the end of the world. The timing doesn't look right. Uh, we can still record, we play, record lectures and provide them to replay, ask them to, uh, uh, to answer questions, ask foreign students to answer questions, and then, to, and then to complete a survey or interviews later on. We can have online discussions. Now, online discussions make a lot of sense there because it's asynchronous communication. We don't need to be real time. So poly U students ask questions. Uh, they, uh, mm -hmm. students from other universities, answer the questions. Common assignments, joint project team, all these can apply. Sharing of reflections. So I'll skip uh, all these. There are challenges. Challenges in time, challenges in uh, having a common time, challenges in finding a common group of students with similar background, right? Challenges in designing the pedagogy, but uh, Overcoming some of these challenges, there is a beautiful green pasture uh, behind it. And I'm especially excited about this because there's no physical equipment. It's taking education to a whole new dimension. So as I said, you know, to, uh, my, uh, my target collaboration groups are uh, university uh, in Europe and also in South Africa. And, uh, and recently also a Russian university. So maybe uh, just for a minute, uh, this is uh, um, assistant professor uh, Henry uh, Hussein from uh, La Peranta, University of Finland. And he has been collaborating with me on uh, two years on a lecture on personal knowledge management. We both run this subject and we both cover this topic. And let's see what he has to say. Hi, my name is Henry Hussinki and I'm working as uh, assistant professor of business analytics at LUT University of Finland. PolyU professor Eric Chu gave a visiting lecture on my course, Knowledge Management Systems and Technologies. After his uh, insightful guest lecture, we had a Q&A session between uh, Professor Chu and my students. The feedback of the uh, lecture and the Q&A session was fantastic, as uh, all my students thought that uh, Eric's uh, guest lecture was really, really uh, up to date and uh, uh, thought provoking. My students were able to gain different, uh, different perspectives on KM, because usually we are uh, uh, only seeing uh, noise management as a corporate issue, but Eric's, uh, Eric's uh, guest lecture opened up this uh, uh, issue of personal knowledge, knowledge management how really important it is to uh, manage the personal knowledge in order to uh, establish lifelong learning and uh, career develop development of my students. 
overall speaking, it was a really fruitful a collaboration. And uh, I would like to continue on this uh, track also in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. I think uh, we deserve a break and uh, scan the QR code. There are a number of questions that I'm asking you to, uh, to complete. Now we'll begin the second part of the workshop today. Thank you, Professor Chi. Well, wonderful. This, uh, this seminar really, really measured me with military precision. Okay, let's have a look at the, uh, the survey. Um, and I hope you realize that, in fact, you can advance it this time. Well, let's have a look. Um, any other challenges in the, in the teaching and learning in the 21st century? Compete with mobile devices. Uh, students tend not to read, even though for language, they may not like to read, but hopefully they like to watch, uh, uh, you know, uh, motion animations. But this might in gaming, right? Teaching of teachers of well, more them don't believe in technology. They don't think it's a policy. Oh. Digital divide in equality. I hope the, you know, the, the school is looking into enhancing everyone's uh, digital literacy, not only the students, but also the teachers. Local linguistic citizenship. Wow. Thank you for all that input. I'll be thinking them over. If you have any other input, uh, please uh, let me know. So personal learning environments, um, effective. Thank you. And uh, it's great to see that, uh, you know, to, I've got a forum for people who would like to try. It's wonderful. And co-creation, similar. Well, books are doing out. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> This one that um, you know uh, has got the score the highest hit, effective enhancing learning. Global classroom. Maybe uh, you need time to uh, broker the trust and the collaboration first before you can set up the global classroom. But I, I can tell you, you know, um, based on the feedback that I received from the last uh, two months, uh, just about any uh, university. Uh, any uh, academics that I reach out to, when I mention about the concept of the global classroom, once they understand, uh, they feel very excited and immediately come back saying that, yes, yes, count us in, you know, uh, they want to do it as well. So I think this is a, a very uh, hot topic and it will become a very hot topic. So, uh, okay, so let me uh, go back to the lecture to the second half. Well, not something that I uh, would like to see, but um, I'm going to touch on something that um, I suppose everyone have uh, encountered before. You know, you deliver a lecture, but not many students come. Very, very few. Um, in Hong Kong, it's um, it's not not too bad. I think uh, in America and in Australia, the situation is worse. Um, and then another on the other on the other hand, you may get students to come, but then uh, quite embarrassingly, uh, a considerable number of them uh, doesn't seem to uh, have uh, sufficient uh, energy to uh, carry through the lecture. So, uh, and by the way, this is not a polio picture. All right, <laughs> and not from this institution too. Okay, but you know what I mean. You know this can happen easily. Um, and then we uh, go to another end of the extreme. <laughs> where, you know, the full house, all students are there, all operating a laptop. Well, maybe they are entering multimeter input or maybe they are watching movies. You don't know, right? So uh, out of this, uh, this three, uh, we really um, have some problems there. Um, that means to me that uh, we are not um, running control. We are not in full control. Uh, maybe control is not a good word. Uh, we, our, our, our tactics in uh, 
in getting students to uh, truly uh, devoted, motiv motivated, and contributing, uh, yet remains to be uh, validated, put it this way. So uh, for, based on my reading and based on what I have spoken to other people, I le I'm led to believe that uh, it's really, much, really very much a trust factor. You know, to, uh, uh, of course, we want our students to be motivated, uh, inspirational, and aspire you know, you know, on just about anything that we uh, we uh, we uh, we set them up to learn, uh, but uh, trust and bonding is something that's not going to go away. If we don't have a uh, a good grasp in this, uh, um, you know, the, it should it surely uh, severely underpins our uh, our success. So how can we, you know, to create or create an environment so that you can cultivate better bonding and trust with our students and students and the teachers? You know, don't get me wrong; it's not just a uh, not just between the student and the teacher, but also among the students as well. So again, the, these are difficult questions. Uh, all of us as teachers at the operational level, especially, would have to encounter and constantly we have to, uh, you know, to find ways to get around it. Uh, I'm sure some of you have got uh, some uh, good uh, tips, uh, tactics, solutions to overcome this. Uh, it would be nice if you can share right another thing that i encounter um and i'm sure you have encountered that as well is um you know that you you invite the students to uh to provide feedback uh, in class uh, both physical and also online but uh, it was uh, a resounding silence right silence because um you know nobody uh, would like to uh, to to respond so uh, how do we break the ice in this situation right I'd like to hear from you as well. And then this is a very common uh, question being asked, uh, especially in, uh, in the Hong Kong context, is uh, you know, so when we have an online class like that, um, uh, be interesting to see if someone have a look at uh, today, right now. You know, how many of, uh, of the people online are actually switching on with the camera? And how many of them are just, uh, you know, the, appear to be on, but uh, a static image, put it this way. There's, I mean, there's no price for doing either way, but uh, what drives us, the decision to switch on the camera or switching off the camera, right? What is your policy? Uh, if you have one uh, as a teacher, how do you, uh, you know, that do you demand your students to switch it on? Uh, I mean, based on the latest guideline from uh, PolyUse AR, I don't think there is a, uh, uh, a, 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 a compulsory uh, decision from the university to force students to switch on uh, the camera, okay? Um, now, um, is that the right decision? Um, um, what do you think? I've been uh, reading up on the neuroscience recently, and so far, my uh, very naive understanding in this area has led me to believe that uh, I read about the brain reacts better, especially our, our uh, pre-cortex, our long-term memory, reacts better to, uh, uh, to motions as well as uh, audio signals simultaneously. So if that's the case, uh, then that's a clear sign that uh, when our students and when we communicate, we should be switching on the, the camera in full flight, in full mode, as well as uh, broadcasting the audio in real time, your own, your own voice, not a uh, not a machine voice, not a voiceover by someone else. All right, because that uh, actually helps to cement better understanding, providing better hooks inside our memory for people to um, to gain and acquire whatever you like to communicate to them. Uh, I also have this uh, interesting phenomenon where I was telling you in the last session. Uh, not long ago, I had uh, a, um, a, a, a Eastern culture, uh, you know, the, uh, lecture to Arizona State University, obviously American University in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. And uh, I noticed that uh, when I was uh, broadcasting, uh, that was just me without my students. Uh, and so it's all the ASU students, plus me, plus the lecturer at the other end. And uh, all the cameras are on, of course, including mine and all the students on the other end, uh, on the American end, without the lecturer asking them by default, everyone switch it on. And uh, interesting, because uh, I can see that even uh, one or two students, uh, uh, they are joining the class from the kitchen. One is cooking a steak, 
when he's uh, attending a class. So it's interesting, you know. Um, but uh, then uh, I look back at my own meeting with my students at PolyU, you know, uh, on one occasion, uh, uh, five students together with me and linked up in a uh, Zoom session. And I'm the only person who switched the camera on and nobody uh, switched the camera uh, on in that session as well. So it's intriguing to, to study why there is such a significant, significant divide uh, between these two cultures, right? Uh, I'm not sure whether the Hong Kong culture is the typical Asian culture or not, uh, but uh, just, you know, just this um, totally opposite behavior is interesting enough <laughs> to, uh, to, to study. And uh, I do have some, I do have some uh, loyal students, including some uh, loyal female students. And they told me that uh, uh, they may not have uh, done their makeup. They may have pimples, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, they may not dress properly or uh, whatever. So uh, because of that, uh, they decline to uh, to show their face. So I mean, that this may be some of the partial uh, reasons. And I wonder why the Western students don't have that. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll be interested in your input as well in this uh, three. So um, it's the same uh, QR code. So you can... Uh, you can go and uh, fill that in. Maybe I can come back and uh, revisit some of your input uh, later on. Okay, why I continue to uh, to go with the, the rest of the materials. Okay. Well, this is uh, from last year. After PolyU has delivered one semester of uh, fully online uh, delivery, we uh, uh, the EDC has sent out. Well, not only the EDC, it's a full university have sent out a survey asking all students about the sharing of uh, the reflection and the sharing of the learning experience by learning online entirely throughout the semester. Uh, and the results came through uh, very convincingly. Uh, students said it's an alternative uh, learning experience, uh, but several factors remain. Uh, technological uh, um, uh, reliability is important. Uh, the teacher's fluency in uh, speaking presentation skills are important uh, and also to, um, um, being able to access the online material easily, conveniently, it's also a very important contributing factor uh, to the satisfaction of the uh, study or the learning experience. So, uh, you know, to, with that, uh, these are good uh, input for the university to ensure that these things are being uh, continued to be, uh, to be delivered and maintained at a high quality. And I don't think, uh, based on my reading about the material from uh, other uh, universities conducting similar surveys, I don't think uh, this is uh, uh, anything unusual. In fact, uh, most of the surveys conform to the same set of factors, right? Easy to locate content, uh, well described the content, um, good uh, uh, um, uh, presentation uh, uh, by the teacher, reliable infrastructure, uh, and uh, timely delivery. All these things are important in order to constitute a alternative online learning experience for the learners. Now, of course, uh, being a Hong Kong university, uh, we have a significant number of students from the mainland. So I'm also very keen to know about any specific requirements uh, from them. And so I, uh, I also approach a number of uh, mainland students who are you know, uh, willing and uh, very uh, supportive of our program. And I got uh, you know, somewhat like a, uh, a consolidated uh, feedback from them. And that is, you know, many students in general prefer more face-to-face -face, uh, because uh, they believe it's uh, easier to, uh, you know, to do the, uh, the reading of the facial and the body language, uh, easier to, uh, to absorb what the teacher is saying. And, it also allows them to instantaneously ask any question to interact with the teacher and also other students. Uh, but equally, you know, the, they are also hesitant because, uh, you know, especially online, uh, they do not know if they're going to ask questions, uh, whether that would be seen as an interruption to the teacher's uh, teaching rhythm, right, or pace of activities, uh, and whether that's an annoyance to the rest of the students or not, uh, they seem to uh, 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 they seem to be uh, you know to a lack of confidence or at a loss there. So uh, 
if you are also uh, carrying a uh, significant number of mainland students in your class, perhaps uh, you may um, you know, pay more attention to this part so that uh, your students are more uh, comfortable, should I say, uh, when they attend online classes versus face-to-face uh, -face classes. Terry Hex worked uh, back in 2020, talked about uh, uh, the, big, the answers to the big question. How can we engage students in online classes? You know, online classes, uh, while it's, it's convenient, uh, but it poses uh, significant uh, challenges as well, because, uh, you know, how can we keep up the interest of the students when studying <clears throat> online? How can we make sure that, um, or how do we know <clears throat> that they are paying attention, you know? How can we keep up with their aspiration and motivation? Uh, how do we facilitate an environment for them to learn from each other, not just learn from the teacher, right? And again, the materials um, uh, that are good for them to study on their own, uh, as well as uh, having a, a, a space for them to reflect, to discuss and learn from each other. So all these matters, and I'll try to go through each one of these and see that we now routine, um, you know, to delivery, these are some of the things that we can surely do uh, and easily do in our delivery of uh, hybrid teaching uh, as well as uh, online classes. <clears throat> and I mean, this is just my own version. I'm sure that uh, in your case, in your teaching, if you want to attend to these dimensions, uh, you can come up with your own solution in designing uh, the, um, the way to design, to deliver uh, the subject as well. Remember in the first session, of today's seminar, we show the uh, uh, the the um, um, the combination lock uh, diagram by the, by the two authors, Beard and Wilson, uh, which I said that uh, they are very useful. Whenever you design the delivery of a course, you have to pay attention to uh, you know the motivation, the learning environment, the technical uh, part, uh, the emotions, the feelings, right, and the sensing, among other things, that the learners. Would have to uh, would to uh, have to go through in order to acquire that uh, that learning experience. So what else we can also do to enhance bonding and trust with the students? I keep on asking myself because to me this is a fundamental question. Now with COVID nineteen, everybody knows uh, the chance for students to um, to meet each other face to face is uh, very limited, right? We surely do not encourage them to come back to uni uh, and uh, meet. Uh, and there are also social distancing rules. So uh, it's not in the university interest to attract students to come back to, uh, to university, it's sad to say. Uh, but at the same time, I suppose you also agree, many of our assessments require students to work together, right? So um, this is especially tough for students in the first year of entry because uh, being first year, in that cohort, they probably have not met any other students in the same discipline, right? Yet, from week five or week six onwards, you ask them to, um, to form teams, right? To start uh, doing a project. So I would feel very uncomfortable. So um, I suppose a, to me, a simple way, hopefully a student will also agree, a straightforward way, may not be simple, but straightforward way to overcome that is to invite our student to record a video, right? A short video. And uh, I only set a maximum time limit of two minutes, right? And I invite them, it's not compulsory. Record a video about yourself, uh, where you're from, why you're doing this particular uh, program and what you expect to, um, to gain out of this subject, right? Um, maybe something uh, personal, if you do not mind, um, you know, and um, do it with a bit of fun as well. So. Uh, I have some success with this. Usually, uh, 70%, 70 percent, seven zero, of the class respond, uh, and they have a uh, and they put up a video. And the the way that I I, uh, I capture them is ask them to self record it, either use a camera or use the smartphone, and upload it to uh, a tool called Flipgrid, which is owned by Microsoft and it's free. That has worked very well uh, because I have a feedback from the students at the end of the semester saying that uh, these, um, these videos, despite very short, 
have helped them to know each other much better. And it's also helped them a lot in, the, in their hunt and decision to collaborate with other students to form a team, right? Because they don't have the opportunity to come back to uh, uni to meet each other. Well, similar techniques has also been applied, uh, similar and even better techniques that have been applied by some of my colleagues. And I want to go through some of them as well, giving credit to them. To, uh, Daniel Leung, Dr. Leung, uh, assistant professor at SXDM at PolyU. Uh, he uh, was the recipient of last year's uh, uh, faculty award on uh, online teaching. So uh, he's done uh, wonderful work. And allow me to uh, summarize his presentation. He gave a EDC seminar uh, summarizing his, uh, his, uh, his uh, 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 tactics, right? Obviously, uh, it would be inappropriate to uh, replay that seminar because it took about an hour. So I have summarized it and uh, share the highlight with you here. So Dr. Leung's technique is to show empathy, right? Uh, empathy is a big thing, you know, that similar to building trust and, uh, uh, and, and bonding with students. So empathy on the student, think from their perspective about what do they need, okay? And see how within our jurisdiction can cultivate the best environment to help them. Develop user-friendly course pages. It's very true, you know, when students don't have, you know, the luxury and the ease of contacting the lecturer as if in a physical uh, convenient environment, your online material is very important because students would have to turn to that in order to navigate their way around, knowing what you expect, knowing what they need to do in the course, knowing what they have to finish in week three, week four and week five. So. If you don't make this material readily available, if you don't make this material and information easy to be, uh, to be interpreted and found, then um, it's gonna cause very tough life for, for online students. Dr. Learn also have the habit of uh, conducting a warm up activity. Uh, I haven't tried that uh, and I should try. Uh, so uh, it's an icebreaker, I suppose, before commencing uh, the, uh, the class every time, something simple, something straightforward. He runs his class very well uh, and uh, well-timed with lots of actions, right? And, uh, and another thing, this is again, uh, grounded in neuroscience research, you know, don't try to repeat the same thing uh, for your three hours, perturb the pattern, you know? Some pattern could be mini lectures, some patterns could be doing some game, some patterns could be, uh, you know, uh, some pedagogy, maybe uh, on uh, filling some quizzes, discussion about them. Uh, some may be proactive asking certain students to share, right? So a combination of things will keep on getting our brains interested, refreshed it, and therefore, supposedly, keeping students' motivation intact for the, uh, the three hour session. Wonderful. Writings on the wall, you know, people are interested in videos, motions, rather than text. I think mean, earlier on in Mentimeter, uh, I had the input saying that these days students doesn't want to read, not these days, for many days already, right? For many years, people don't want to read, right? So instead of reading, find other ways of communicating what you try to communicate in a more, uh, you know, uh, lively uh, and uh, fun way. Don't overload the students with content and also the LMS. I think, uh, I think we, everybody knows that. Design your teaching materials for the students, right? Student-centric, rather than for the teacher. Obtain feedback, which is a very good technique as well. Because the feedback at the mega level tells you, you know, the, what the students care about, uh, whether any part they have difficulties and so forth. It's uh, instantaneous. At the microscopic level, again, neuroscience research indicate that uh, if the student can give you feedback, you can tell based on the words they use, the term they use, to see how much their brain have actually consolidated the information you communicate to them, right? If they have to use precisely the same word, the same term, the same sentence that you use, just reading out what you have just told them, that is not an indicator that they have consolidated the information, right? So obtaining feedback, more feedback, uh, instantaneous feedback from students is very helpful.
But SXTM seems to uh, constantly come up with very good teachers. <laughs> My second example, also from uh, the same uh, faculty, this time from uh, Dr. Kim Hong. And uh, she impressed me with her online uh, classes a lot in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, you know, pictures, real pictures of students. Right, so even though that uh, students are not attending the class, right, she would have pictures of the student sticking in front of her so that she knows uh, uh, the name and she can call on the students and whenever she, she wants to, in order to ask the students uh, questions. So you can see that on the right hand side screen. Wonderful, you have all these uh, passport photos stick in front of her, of her monitor. Uh, for that, I should try that as well. Well, that was one. And when uh, running a hybrid class where you have uh, students, you know, so people sitting inside the classroom and people who are online, she would do this. She would ask the technical team to set up additional cameras, right? So that, you know, the, everyone, especially people online, can have multiple views about what's happening in the room as well. Right? Again, you know, the, uh, you know, sorry for my naiveness. My recent reading in neuroscience convinced me this is a good tactic, right? Because the brain is more open to uh, to any uh, comprehensive information that tells us about uh, you know the, anything that is moving and uh, having a more comprehensive view of uh, of uh, what we're supposed to be seeing and listening to what we're supposed to be listening, you know, simultaneously live, and that adds to the understanding. Right, so Dr. Hong, uh, I'm not sure whether she's a neuroscientist or not. She surely do anything that is uh, that is right, you know, the, in terms of uh, applying the right principle and theory to ensure and enhance the understanding of the students in person and also online. She has games as well, uh, which I won't talk about this time. Um, and by the way, I'm also starting a gaming project. So for those of you interested. We can touch base and talk about that uh, a few months later. An article in uh, <clears throat> in uh, uh, Nature, you know, the, by uh, Barbara Oakley, a very famous uh, researcher on the learning to learn, and Barbara Oakley's, uh, you know, the very um, uh, convincing principles for ensuring the success in online education boil down to these. Um, Dozen uh, factors, you know, multimedia material, coherence between the material that you're providing, you know, signaling, right, uh, having pre-training about how to use those material, spatial and temporal uh, contiguity, pre-training material, segmenting, modality, personalization, voice, embodiment, animation, image principle, right? You're not forced to use all of this, but having a variety and a combination of this surely help, right? And making sure that uh, you know you are you are you are abiding by these good principles when you develop and deliver your online material. And by the way, you know the, Robert Oakley is also also the author of the uh, neuroscience approach to teaching book that I've been reading. So if we go back to um, Dr. Lerm's approach at SXTM, and in the light of uh, you know, the, Dr. Oakley's uh, um, uh, requirements on how to deliver good online teaching. You know, Dr. Learn's uh, uh, techniques um, fares extremely well. I mean, she's hitting points, or he is hitting points in the, almost all the dimensions that uh, Dr. Oakley has been uh, talking about in terms of putting up a good online course and getting the students to be interested. You can do a one-on-one -on -one mapping on that, but uh, not here right now, of course. Another one of our teachers, uh, this time Dr. Lam, and uh, he is in the applied uh, uh, faculty of applied science uh, and textile department, and he has been developing uh, STEM courses uh, for students uh, in that area. And he impressed me a lot in terms of, uh, you know, cultivating an environment for uh, for extracurricular learning activities, especially for international uh, students. So you can say that he's also a pioneer in internationalization at home. But in addition to that, Dr. Lamb's work also uh, excels 
in treating the world as the laboratory. You know, for most of the science and engineering researchers, you know, you have a laboratory and it's your laboratory and you do work and research in that laboratory. But Dr. Lam is different. He treats the world as the laboratory. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, he's equipping the students with an app. This app allows the student to carry, um, you know, the app inside the smartphone anywhere. And this smartphone with the app can take data from different readings, from different devices in different environments, and we bring back to body you to compute uh, the, uh, the calculations uh, that they need to do and then present to other students, right? So to me, it's really, uh, you know, you turn it upside down, you are treating uh, the world as your, uh, as your open classroom, which is uh, wonderful. And uh, you may re remember that uh, uh, some of the good techniques that we talk about uh, in session one uh, before the break is uh, asking students for feedback and also getting them to do uh, reflective journals. And uh, that surely is something that uh, Dr. Lam strongly advocates and get his students to contribute as well. So he, he offers or uh, he organizes international uh, cultural events uh, with international students and uh, every uh, uh, student from an ethnic group would have to present a cultural dish from their own uh, origin and explain uh, you know, about their culture. So I suppose that's uh, very enriching because uh, it would be very interesting and help every student to understand, better understand about uh, the local culture of the other student. I think these are all food, which is great. You know, the Chinese people like uh, to chit chat and uh, and talk and uh, build relationship over food segments. So, as I said, uh, Dr. Lam also have uh, de developed the apps uh, that ask the students to install these apps and then go out to uh, different parts in Hong Kong, to, whether that's uh, city or rural areas, and start taking readings of various uh, uh, places uh, for various purposes. And then uh, these data are being brought back to, to get a uh, compare and post compare with other poly use uh, uh, students' uh, uh, recorded writings, uh, recorded, recorded data for learning purposes. So I think it's wonderful, with, which is again, you know, the, another living proof of what I said earlier, you know, the students and graduates are the eyes and ears of the course, right? So send them out and uh, collect things from the rest of the world and bring them back to the classroom for sharing. Well, of course, you know, there is COVID-19, uh, maybe you don't need to bring it back to the classroom, bring it back to a virtual room for sharing. So here are some of the great work of uh, Dr. Lam's, uh, some, uh, some data collections uh, on campus, and then uh, ultimately data collections uh, outside of campus in various parts of Hong Kong as well. I thought it was wonderful because I told him, you know, the, you are, you are, you know, the really uh, uh, treating the well as you open the laboratory. I think that's a big game. Uh, 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 do not under, underestimate this, you know. Uh, so uh, Dr. Lam also, uh, you know, to inject a lot of fun and humor yeah, in his uh, teaching. And that is, again, wonderful because uh, when we, uh, when our brain encounters uh, fun and humor, it relaxes, it creates breaks. And these breaks, you know, the interruptions allow the brain to reorganize and learn better, you know, in the next uh, iteration. So, you know, the, um, no need to elaborate anymore. I mean, you can see that uh, these are hallmarks of all the good things that these teachers have done. And based on the principles, they are surely uh, doing that in the right way and do it substantially. What are the additional things that uh, we can do in order to, uh, you know, to help students to uh, concentrate better? Especially, uh, you know, we all know that uh, a three hours lecture is not a good thing because uh, the attention span is much, much less than that. I read about uh, the attention span is uh, anything between, uh, well, it's not between, it's uh, roughly uh, the age of a person plus one in terms of minutes. Well, of course, there's a limit. And uh, the limit that I've read so far is anything between uh, 25 to 27 minutes. But uh, if you count a youngsters, a youngster uh, of, uh, for example, 14 or 15 years of age, then this person's attention span to, uh, to absorb something is only about 15, 16 minutes, right? 
in MOOC videos, we were told not to uh, develop MOOC uh, videos anything more than seven minutes, right? Um, I'm not sure why. Maybe that's uh, that's an indication of the uh, of the of the brain maturity of the learners, right? Uh, hope not. So this is the, the style that I, I use as well to, in terms of um, breaking up uh, what's supposed to be a three hours lecture into tiny components so that uh, we can still enforce or enact active learning among the students, okay? Now, uh, you start off with, let's say, uh, you know, for, for this week, we need to cover these topics. So I chunk them into different subcomponents, And I give uh, a mini lecture on, uh, on the first component, for example, and that may be uh, 10 minutes, um, no, nothing more than that. And then I ask students to, uh, to discuss or to uh, find additional material and discuss. So you give them something to do, okay? But we stop the lecture, okay? I then may ask the students, different student groups, to compare about uh, their deliberations and then summarize, I summarize, you know, in most cases, about what they have discussed, all right? So in a class of three hours, I can easily do three to four cycles of this, maybe a little bit more, okay? And that's, I found it to be very uh, useful because uh, that is a lot more effective than doing a three hour lecture. You know, the scientific uh, uh, research has already indicated that uh, in most cases, a person can only take in three or four key messages in a seminar, right? So if in three hours you deliver too many main points, that doesn't mean much to the average learner, right? So much better is you do a mini presentation followed by some exercise. Exercise where the learners have to do, have to think, have to explain, have to discuss, right? Typically with his or her peers, okay? And then uh, you can repeat this cycle several times. And that's precisely what I've done. Well, in iteration number two, let's say you're still within the three hours. You can, for example, you can have uh, another person to broadcast, uh, and, you know, to a guest lecture, a mini lecture, right? You can ask students to do some searches and uh, discuss about another topic. You can set up a panel uh, and ask students to, uh, you know, to, to take questions and answer Questions, you help them, of course. And you can even nominate one of the students from one of the panels to do a final summary. You help them, of course. You help him or her, of course. But, uh, you know, give the opportunity to the student and uh, from what they say, from what they, um, from what their feedback, from what they perform, you can get a good uh, assessment about uh, whether they have truly learned something or not, because, uh, Good teaching is not trying to put concept into people's head. Good teaching is supposed to extract concept out of the learner's head. Why extract? Because extract the way they describe it, linking your new concept with other things that they know. You know, that's the that's the test, the limit test for good teaching. So as I said, in a three-hour session, you can do this uh, several times. You can do it several cycles, and I have done precisely that, uh, and uh, with uh, uh, with uh, very good uh, feedback from the students as well. I'm going to continue to try this, and and now that knowing that uh, this is the right way to go, uh, uh, I should do more of it as well. <clears throat> so, what do you do? Remember, in uh, in the second step, you can ask students to do a lot of things. So, what are some of these things? that you can ask them to do. Don't try to do the same thing in subsequent cycles because the brain will work better if it is more variety, all right? So what are some of the things that you can ask them to do? You can ask them to annotate some material. You can ask them to summarize and report and present. You can set them up to search for something and report on what they have searched, criteria they have used, and comment on the accuracy of the search results. You can all ask them to provide feedback after discussions among themselves, right? You can ask them to map certain concepts 
with other things that they already know and see whether the articulation is done properly, right? You can ask them to present the result in a visually expressive way, mind map, other types, knowledge graphs, for example. You can ask students to work together and co-create a deliverable, whatever that is. You can ask students to create you know, a two-pager summarizing what they, have, uh, uh, what they have discovered. So that's creation. And you can even ask them to set up a, uh, for example, a photo gallery uh, listing about some of the highlights of what they have uh, discussed, some of the things that they have uh, taken uh, and uh, uh, show it in an artistic way. What about asynchronously? You know, in online teaching, um, there's the synchronous component, which uh, is like this, you know, despite where I have, uh, I don't know, 60, 70 people online. Uh, we are online, we are, you know, uh, we are interacting in real time, right? We are connecting in real time. But uh, in, uh, in, in normal uh, courses, we also have offline, right? Uh, asynchronous, right? In other words, uh, you know, you would be studying as a student while I'm sleeping, right? And uh, uh, I may be doing other things when you are replaying uh, my recorded lecture, for example. So how can we ensure that uh, there's also plenty of things for students to practice, to learn, to reinforce the learning uh, in asynchronous mode? So in other words, they don't expect to have real-time feedback on what they have provided, okay? So one way to do that uh, is, uh, I'm right in the thick of it, doing now is, um, uh, it's quite uh, um, intriguing to students as well. You know, I'm trying to turn some of the past papers, which is no secret because past papers are already in the library. I turn them into some kind of role play or games, right? And I ask students to tackle them. So upon tackling them, they would have a good uh, uh, understanding about how good they are mastering uh, that particular concept. Uh, I mean, it's wonderful if the lecturer gives you uh, some past papers to tackle and you can ask the lecturer uh, what you have done wrong, how can you answer this question better. So I don't even need to provide any additional incentive, right? It's already there for them to try. I can set an exercise in class and then ask the students to start doing it with the ultimate goal of submitting the result uh, maybe in a week or so, and that also works. I may record a message and let students know, hey, you know, the last week we have talked about this and next week it's going to be a new concept and how this new concept is linked to what you have already known, okay? So articulate the content from week to week. Very useful because uh, especially during COVID-19, we can only deliver a course online. It's important to send out a message and maintain that expectation with the student that uh, the online and online uh, synchronous and asynchronous session in total constitute the learning platform and the learning empathy, right? So your professor, your teacher, don't just talk about the course when you see him or her online. He or she is still thinking and updating that course, providing things for you to do, giving you feedback while you are not at the same lecture time. Very important to send out this message. And the best way to do it, I believe, is to lead by example. Provide incentives for students to look for OER material. Yeah, so uh, this one I talk about that. I use it in the PLEM. Again, something that I use in the PLEM. Allocate marks based on consistent effort throughout the semester. As I told my students, you know, you want to get good marks for the PLEM, which you have totally control of. You can't do it, cram everybody, everyone in one semester. You have to put in, justify you put in consistent effort over the entire semester. And that means almost every week, I have to see there are some contributions for me, right? And for some students, this is extremely um, uh, un, uh, uneasy for them because they don't use to this. They used to cramming, as you understand, you know, uh, before one week before the uh, the exam or two nights before the exam, they start reading through all those books and try to stick and cram it into their brain, right? Even if they are successful with that, they would not have learned anything substantial. 
because they did not have time to actually digest the material. So therefore, you know, uh, it would be great if we uh, don't provide incentive for doing that. Instead, we say that, uh, look, uh, in order to get marks, high marks, you have to contribute consistently throughout the semester. P2P sharing of project summaries, reflections, and so forth. You know, uh, as I said, students don't learn, don't just learn from the teacher. Students should also learn from each other. Something I have demonstrated with my MOOC audience, a crowdsource content from the internet, right? Uh, so when you have a MOOC, when you have a course, it's, uh, it's very delightful because you have students from, uh, wow, you know, over 190 countries. So uh, be behind that, wow, make use of it, right? It's not very common, not common that you have the students from 190 countries on your course. So send message to those students and ask them to report on any potential applications or interesting things from their country regarding that particular topic of the MOOC, all right? And then uh, if you find the material to be very insightful, you can go back to the student, ask for the permission to participate more and develop it as real content for the next delivery. I find it very useful. Once again, same principle, you know, the students and graduates are the eyes and ears of your course. So this is uh, some summary of uh, using um, uh, podcast and every week, it doesn't take long, only about two minutes per podcast. Just uh, give a podcast. I usually do it on the weekend, uh, saying that hey, you know, the last week, uh, last week we were talking about this, and next week, uh, guess what? We'll be covering these topics. And of course, uh, I say it in a in a more natural fashion rather than so direct. And I explain to them, you know, why these topics are uh, articulated to, together, why the next topic is this and not something else, right? So they get a total view of the full course is being uh, managed by the professor. And at different weeks, uh, they are concentrating on certain area as uh, provided by the professor. Uh, but, uh, you know, they are also rest assured that these, link, these modules are linked together in uh, some intrinsic or dependent way. You like this one as well. Uh, similar concept. And this time, you know, uh, I'm, I'm teaching um, knowledge management. And uh, out there, of course, uh, you know, many students would like to become a knowledge management profession, uh, either a KM administrator or more senior, can be a KM consultant uh, or a KM manager, right? Okay, so uh, they can read from the textbook about what are the roles of a KM profession, what are the roles of a KM manager. But I give them an even better source of, uh, of, uh, of, of input. And that is, uh, you know, I do a call for uh, uh, call for uh, recording about uh, all knowledge professionals. If you do not mind sharing about what you do in your everyday life, in your job capacity, please, you know, click this button and record five minutes on what is your role as a PM professional in your organization. And this is uh, wonderful again, because the students find it very, very useful. These are people uh, who are famous, renowned, internationally uh, uh, acclaimed. And these people uh, record uh, five minutes for our website and uh, talked about uh, what they, they what did I do? What are their responsibilities as a KM professional? Uh, so this is also accumulated. I'm accumulating all this in preparation for supporting the student in the next cohort. I think this was back in March. <clears throat> where we invite a number of teachers and we also go back to uh, our repository of, uh, of uh, delivered seminars. And uh, collectively, we, uh, you know, we highlight to uh, body your colleagues about uh, one of the challenges and uh, tips for doing better online teaching. And we accumulate it in this set of uh, notes. Uh, maintain eye contact design activities that involve the students, be student-centric, not teacher-centric. Help students to know each other, cultivate an environment so that they can meet each other. 
they can replay the video of other students in the class, and then they can contact them if they so wish to. <clears throat> Make sure that you uh, add value to the bonding and the trust. Provide clear instructions, easy to find material. Give incentives to students, you know, for connecting, for sharing, like in the PLEN, 10%, not much. You may want to give insights to students uh, if they want to share their reflections as well. Design pedagogies that take advantage of the environment, whether it is global classrooms or other types of uh, setups. Here are your communications and uh, make sure that you manage your students' expectations. Again, I find that this uh, word uh, empathy, it's uh, all around us. You know, the, if, you, uh, if you can only reduce to one word that you can take action, you can remember, then it's empathy, right? It's about uh, understanding and caring about where the student's coming from, you know, from their perspective, and then do work from there. And do it from that angle, put it this way. Right, let me see. So please go to um, the QR code uh, and use the QR code to, uh, to provide more input again, please. I think you can advance to that screen automatically. So let's have a look at uh, what you have put in. What can be done to enhance bonding and trust? Give a self introduction. Yes, very good. Give that introduction. You can uh, record one. Remember, uh, our brain reacts better to looking at uh, you know videos and uh, listening to uh, audio of the person. Any others? Maybe we can have a look at the other answers first. Okay, when inviting students to participate or contribute, how to break the ice if nobody responds? I'm interested, interested to know the answer. Gamification, play a game, use lucky draw. Yes, I use that um, fortune wheel, wheel of fortune as well, and turn, da, 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 da. oh, you're lucky, lucky day, John Chan, please respond. <laughs> and uh, you laugh, of course. And then when I say John Chan, John Chan, are you there? Mr. Chen, are you there? And then everyone else is laughing because they know that uh, he's there just a name, right? It's so embarrassing, right? Multiple choice for the name Lucky Draw, yes. Pick a student to voice out his or her opinion. Yeah, I try to do that, yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, we all know in the class there are some students that are more proactive than others, right? Uh, to the extreme, you have students who often put up their hand and want to answer the question. And the other extreme is, it's a dead silence. It's nobody, right? Call student's name, game, give student hints. Ah, give student hints. Very good. I'm serious. Very good because uh, it's a technique called scaffolding. Uh, I tried that as well, you know. To, uh, and uh, I have evidence because the loyal students told me, your professor, I, we are not, uh, we, we, we would like to respond. But sometimes we don't know whether our answer is stupid or naive, right? So they don't have the confidence, right? So, um, and they may want to ask something or even respond. So um, whoever provides this, it's, this input is excellent. Give student hints is the technique uh, that we normally call a scaffold, right? So give them a bit more time, give them a bit of hint, uh, hand feed them, break down the problem into a simpler one, and go through with them step by step. So it's like yeah, you know, tempting a little puppy uh, to come out of the hole and um, and come to your come to your arms, right? You have to tempt them uh, uh, gradually. Make it easy for students to respond. Of course, I mean, I think these are things for granted. Very good. Encourage students with incentives. Yes. Anything else? 
gaming. Okay, so that many colleagues also go for this gaming technique. Okay, two lucky draw of two names. Yeah, okay, same technique. Right, okay, so uh, I'd love to see your input. During online session, should students switch on or off their webcam? Do you have a policy on this? Did anyone uh, curiously have a look at uh, today's session among the people? How many have the webcam on? How many have the webcam off? <laughs> Let me guess. 95% of off. Hundred percent off. Okay. We need to reach out to see whether they are really off or just off the picture. <laughs> but look at the the choices I gave you. Uh, from the left, you have student must switch on the webcam. Student webcam must be on while presenting. When I talk to a student, his webcam must be on. I have. <clears throat> I leave this decision to the student. I do not have a policy. I have alternative view. For me personally, uh, I adopt this one. And I think I have a good reason for that. I tell my students that, uh, you know, presentation, your facial language, your body gestures is part of the presentation, right? So if you switch off the cam, fine. I will still mark your presentation, but for sure you'll be losing some components because I only got the audio, right? So with that, usually they will put on the, uh, the video as well. Um, but I, I think we should solve the problem from the, from the root cause rather than our personal preference. No decision, okay. It's strange, only one person attempt this question. <laughs> okay, we have one. How to do tests in the hybrid lesson? Uh, experience is still building up. Uh, last semester, uh, the AMA department uh, at PolyU have conducted very large scale of online proctor exam, and they have uh, individually uh, 300, 300 plus students simultaneously across five subjects, right? Now, to, to answer your question, uh, the AMA has got a lot of experience. And you can also, you know, to put invigilators in the physical room. That's easier, right? But I think the, the most difficult part is to invigilate the online exam. We have a, we had a seminar on that uh, yes, uh, last week. And um, I think the recording is uh, ready to be replayed. So if you're interested, you can replay that recording uh, by uh, Dr. Zhang. Uh, Hua Zhang from AMA department at PolyU. And uh, his team was uh, fabulous. They can even detect uh, how two students are actually collaborating in the same room. You know how they discover it? You know how they discover it? Should I say? This is trade secret. <laughs> they analyze the background of the photo and they find that it's the same curtain, the same painting. <laughs> that, that, that's human intelligence. <laughs> okay, let me uh, finish... Um, Oh, a few minutes. Oh, that's great. Let me finish something that's uh, hopefully equally exciting. Overall speaking, I think in the long run, university will evolve into learning communities, right? Not just teaching courses and, uh, uh, you know, graduating people, but uh, as, a, as a nucleus of expertise and garnering a group of people who are interested in certain uh, topics, in certain areas. So have you thought about, everyone here is an experienced teacher. Uh, every year, we always, let's say we teach the same subject with updates, right? So every year there are, you know, the average performance, large group are average students, very small group have difficulties, a very small group, very exceptional students. Understood, thank you, right? So have you ever thought about that we can actually slice off the top 5%, the best students and collect them in a group, keep up their interests and continue to breed them and they can help the existing students? And this is another project that I have done, you know. To, so I use it in the MOOC, right? In the MOOC, the way I have done uh, seven to eight delivery as well. In the MOOC, after every week, students become less and less and less and less, right? So therefore, the people who remain at the last week, usually, uh, the last few weeks, usually are the top students 
and the students who really care want to finish that course. So only towards the end, I tell them that you can join the community, right? So if you have only studied the first two weeks, you don't know about that, okay? Because I only inform them when they are towards the end of this end of this course, all right? So in second delivery, I do the same thing. So the students are joining this community. I have a community, like a MiWi community, that hold all of them, all right? And I'm surely collecting all those students or the top cream of those students who are interested, enthusiastic, motivated, and continue want to learn and connect with the instructor, even after they graduate. So you do that for a few cohorts, you have your trusted group of uh, students, okay? And this group can do amazing things for us because it can be advocacy group. You spend time, you know, discussing with them as well. They may have questions for you, right? And uh, chances are increasingly these people would be working graduates rather than students because by the time uh, you collect a few cohorts, uh, the first few cohorts, the uh, students are graduates are working already. So similar to, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to what I've described before, I can use these people, use is the right word, I can deploy these people to the PLEM, I can deploy these people to nominate good content, I can deploy these people to help discussing and lead the younger students who need help. And I can also use this group to, um, to give me feedback on things that I want to do. So uh, it's wonderful. Um, and then, so this is a technique where you can collectively pack together a group of loyal learners, uh, passionate learners who have excelled and continue want to be connected and remain connected with the teacher and with the university. All right, so I think it's time to, uh, to call an end here. And this is at the beginning to open up your imagination. I would say that the world is your classroom and the sky is the limit. Thank you very much, Professor Chu, for the wonderful sharing. Coming up, we would like to invite Dr. Adam Wong to lead a Q&A session. Dr. Wong, please. Thank you. OK, let's give a big hand uh, to Professor Chu for his um, talk on how to cope with the post-19 uh, teaching situations. Okay, the challenges, opportunities, and best practices. Uh, I'm sure that uh, every one of us, either here in the, in the lecture theater or at home has learned a lot. So now uh, I would like to invite uh, all the participants, uh, no matter where you are, uh, please uh, give us your questions. Okay, you can, for the participants in the classroom, you can uh, raise your hand, and for the participants online, you can uh, type in your questions uh, in the chat room. Okay, so we have one, uh, one, hand. one hand here. Okay, so let me hand you the microphone. Oh, okay, you got it already. Yeah, a wonderful uh, talk. And the uh, Professor Choi, you talking about uh, the hybrid teaching, you talking about the uh, online teaching. So um, what, um, what uh, the, uh, you, you give us the tips uh, that is to say, we uh, you suggest to uh, cut the lecture, three-hour lectures into different uh, in the several cycles, and then the on each cycle you uh, you you are supposing giving out a small lecture, and then somehow you have activities, and then the students uh, would be presenting something, and then you summarize. So um, can I um, put it in another, in another way is that the, um, uh, we, we do not give a, 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 the mini lecture. Instead, uh, I, will, I will ask a student to, um, uh, to watch a video, uh, maybe at home. Yes. Yeah, and then they come to the class and then they start the discussion so that we could cover more material. What do you think? Thank you for that uh, question. And uh, what you have described is commonly known as the flip the classroom concept, where we uh, release some material and ask the students to, uh, to, uh, to go through those material first. And then we uh, therefore, therefore uh, allow us to have more time for more in-depth discussion. Now that will work and that is an alternative, but uh, do be careful 
because uh, uh, for complex concepts, students need guidance. So the direct lecture, the one-way lecture has its value because uh, we as teachers are more experienced. We help students to cultivate the mind to understand the more difficult concept. So those cannot unfortunately be replaced by mere uh, you know, pre-recorded videos. So in other words, to answer your questions, in some cases, you can. In some cases, you should maintain with your, uh, with your uh, you know, one-way lecture and then do the, uh, do the uh, uh, exercise later. But some, you can provide, provide uh, you know, offline video and ask them to replay first. And that depends on the complexity of the material. Okay, thank you, Professor Che. Uh, I've got a question uh, in the chat room. Uh, one uh, participant asked, as uh, Dr. Wao Chen, he asked, Professor Che, there's a question from me as well. Uh, could you pr uh, briefly share how you made those uh, moving animated photos in PowerPoints? For example, the word empathy on a spinning board. Right, thank you. Um, very good question. Uh, firstly, I do not have an assistant. I do all of them on my own. Secondly, I'm not sure whether I'm breaching the rule by mentioning any commercial companies. <laughs> uh, you are not. I think you feel free to do All right. Well, then uh, have a look at the company called Presenter Media. Presenter Media. Okay. One word. Most of my animations are from there. I made it. They have a library of tools and uh, it's already preset. You can color by, you know, the, the skin color, you can color by the moving angle, you can color by the words. <laughs> uh, I hope they are not uh, too expensive. Oh, you can buy millions of copies. Okay, good, good. <laughs> okay, Dr. Zhang, please. Okay, so um, uh, both today and also back in uh, Polio proper last time, you, uh, well, you advised uh, us to... Uh, to cut a long lecture into small chunks, right? That is uh, uh, for the reason of uh, attention span. Well, that that's that sounds very, I mean, uh, 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 reasonable. However, I have to worry that uh, we can't cover <laughs> the syllabus. That is my my real worry. So, uh, what uh, what would be your advice? Okay, uh, again, that's. Um just by the sound of it, it's a tough question. I cannot comprehensively answer it because I'm not in a position to evaluate the, um, the substantial nature of the content you said in the curriculum. What I do know is uh, I teach not to cover all the concepts for the students. I teach to inspire the students to learn more. Okay. So I would like to add to this point. Okay, if you are teaching a class uh, which is not too big, then you can combine the tutorial hour with the lecture hour. So it gives you three hours. Okay, that, that is a little bit better. Okay, but if you have a really large class, then um, there's so much you can do in this uh, two hour lecture time. Okay, but then uh, you may want to combine uh, Dr. What's the idea? Okay, so they're watching some videos uh, to cover some of the basic concepts while uh, outside the classroom. So when they come to class, you only give them a brief introduction or a re re reminder, and then they, they go ahead and do their discussions and those activities. You can also make up both uh, uh, asynchronous communications, right? Uh, I mean, who said if you felt the need to, uh, to share your students with some additional lecture materials, who said you cannot release an additional video there? Nobody said that, <laughs> right? If you feel the need to. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Chui again, and I think I've handed the time uh, back to our MC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. We'll have another QESS seminar on this coming Thursday, July 15th, from 10 to 11.30 a.m., entitled The Future of Monks Post-COVID Pandemic. You're welcome to sign up. The QESS Blended Learning Project will organize more seminars and workshops in the future. Therefore, we would like to have your feedback about today's workshop. For the on-site audience, could you please scan the QR code shown on the screen? And for those attending on Zoom, please fill in the poll which will show up on your screens. <laughs>